Audiobook Title, Mix Audiobook Collection The 30th of September 2023, Title, System vs. Rebirth, 843-852, by Fixton, Chapter 843, Gold. Keel couldn't help but smile when she witnessed the shift on the battlefield. As she expected, the kids would be the greatest weaknesses that Noel and Dimitri had to cover. However, Noel alone wouldn't be enough to stop her and the other spirit grandmasters. She could see that his plan was to let Dimitri defeat Nell for as quickly as possible before helping with this situation. If Dimitri could stop Keel, it wouldn't be much of a problem for Noel to stop the other guys. Sadly, Noel had miscalculated Nelfa's strength. No, more like, Noel had correctly predicted his strength, but Nelfa simply surpassed that expectation. The frustration that Nelfa had endured for the last few days was released at this time, allowing him to continue moving even with such injuries. Nelfa can continue attacking the kids, forcing Dimitri to block his attack and injuring him gradually. The other spirit grandmasters could become a distraction while trying to capture those two kids. I will restrain Noel's movement. Giel recalculated the situation. She considered Dimitri's true spirit body, but there was no sign of it yet. Noel had to do something to escape from this situation, especially if he didn't want Dimitri to use his true spirit body. But would Keel allow him to do so? Keel had aimed her bow at him ready to release multiple arrows. Sensing the fluctuation of energy, Noel couldn't help but furrow his eyebrows. What should I do? If it continues like this, the two kids will be captured before reaching the border. Dimitri might use the true spirit body, but it will lead to a severe delay in my future plans. Is it worth it? But if we can't escape from here, there is no future. No, wait, there is one more thing. Noah looked at Keel with a grim expression as though he had steeled his resolve. Feeling his fighting intent, Keel released three arrows. The first arrow flew straight at him while the other three curved to the left and right. Noel raised both hands. He sent forth Undying Phoenix from his right hand and created Snow Shield on the right. The Undying Phoenix flew at the arrow at first, but it suddenly curved before it reached the arrow as if trying to match the arrow's movement. Exclamation mark Even Keel was surprised. Noel actually matched the arrow movement just so that the arrow was exposed to the fire longer. Even though the arrow was faster, it was enough because the spiritual energy dissipated at high speed to the point where the arrow disappeared before it could reach him. On the other side, the snow shield perfectly blocked the arrow, leaving only a small trace. Noel easily knocked it down with his blade. However, Noel didn't do anything against the arrow that came straight ahead. What? Keel couldn't help but gasp. Is he going to take my arrow? Even though she had split her power into three, the arrow was still considered lethal. Even Noel's strongest abilities had a hard time stopping them. So how could his body receive it? Noel activated three runes at the same time. The first rune was the reduce impact rune from the rune body. It reduced the force that hit his body. The second rune was the spiritual energy dispersion rune, allowing him to scatter the energy that fueled the arrow even for a bit. The last one was rune blast, trying to knock the arrow away. It's not enough. You won't be able to stop it. Keel harumphed. Even though she was surprised by his attempt, it was still not enough. Yet, a smile actually appeared on Noel's face, startling her. Noel used the spirit weaponry to cut spiritual energy itself, but he met with extraordinary resistance. The impact was so big that the shockwave hit him like a giant boulder. K.H. Noel gnashed his teeth as blood seeped out between his teeth. Even with the reduce impact rune, the force was still enough to shake his entire organ, causing some internal injuries. However, this was what Noel wanted. He used his body to receive the force and use it to launch him away. The speed was so fast that it caught up with the other spirit grandmasters. The spirit grandmasters were stunned, not expecting Noel to be able to escape from Keel. The latter hurriedly formed her arrows again, realizing Noel's intention. On the other hand, Noel actually thought, I'm glad that I use my honor points sparingly. Ardagon, exchange the 400 honor points for skill points, and distribute those points to Ardagon swordsmanship and undying fire. It took Hardigan an instant to process everything, fully knowing that he couldn't be slow because Noel's life would be in danger. Converting 400 honor points, 
you've acquired 200 skill points. Using 100 skill points to upgrade Undying Fire. Undying Fire, 3-5. You've acquired Hell Blaze. You've acquired Flame Devil. Using 80 skill points to upgrade Ardagon Swordsmanship twice. Ardagon Swordsmanship, 10-15. You've acquired Imperial Sword. You've acquired Sword Transmutation. A sharp pain instantly jolted his brain as the new information entered his mind. Yet, instead of screaming, Noel was actually smiling. Miracles. Come for those who have prepared. He had been saving a lot of honor points so that he could use them depending on the situation. Before, all his plans had succeeded without any problems, so there was never a chance to use them. Of course, he couldn't use those points in front of an absolute power like the only spirit transcendence level devil saint. Noel raised his right hand, clenching his sword tightly. What is he doing? The spirit grandmasters were surprised that he managed to catch up to them, but they became more confused when Noel made a gesture he had never shown before. That could only mean one thing. Noel had another trump card he hadn't used. But the people couldn't believe Noel actually hid another trump card after getting besieged by all of them and Keel. But the moment they had that thought, Noel swung his blade. Imperial sword. Some of the spirit grandmasters instinctively ducked down, while some raised their weapons to block Noel. But even with several spirit grandmasters, they couldn't even stop Noel's blade as the energy spurred out, extending the blade before erupting to create an enormous force that knocked them down. Although it was a surprise attack, it was still shocking that even several grandmasters couldn't stop Noel's sword. More importantly, the ones who got lucky were actually the knocked ones earlier. A huge fire erupted behind Noel, forming a humanoid silhouette. Even though it was only an upper body, the silhouette was swift as it extended its left hand to catch the spirit grandmasters that were still running. There were three people running side by side. The two on the sides managed to jump away. But because he was surrounded earlier, he couldn't escape from the flame devil's clutch. He was using all his spiritual energy to block the fire, but that flame devil was formed by the undying fire. It instantly evaporated his spiritual energy as the fire began to reduce him to ashes. Ah, the guy was screaming in pain as he felt his body was evaporating. As expected, Keel's arrow arrived and shot down the flame. The momentum caused a bit of a shockwave, obliterating the entire elbow. As a result, the remaining hand fell down and the spirit grandmaster was saved. But the result of two seconds of exposure was horrendous. Both of his arms were already reduced to ashes and a huge portion of his body suffered a huge degree of burn. Even with medical attention, it was practically impossible for him to survive. They never thought the trump card Noel had hidden would be this strong. It wasn't the power of a spirit master anymore. Noel felt the same. After learning about the spiritual energy reserve that Ardagon taught him in the past, he could feel that his body was full to the point where it was a bit suffocating. Additionally, these new techniques required a lot of spiritual energy. Even though he managed to pull back the Grand Masters, his spiritual energy rapidly declined. It wouldn't be long until he emptied it out. Hence, Noel took this chance to draw the Enhance Forward rune, not for himself but for the two kids behind him. Tristan and Sandra were startled as they were suddenly launched forward at high speed. Ah, they were screaming and panicking, thinking they had been captured. But Tristan remembered the effect and the runes and quickly calmed down. Their distance had been reduced to a mere 100 meters. It would only take 15 seconds to cross the border. Go. Noel's shout echoed in their ears. We have to cross the border. Tristan shouted while running to the best of his abilities. We can't let Master down. Ah, gh. Chandra had a hard time keeping up, but she still persisted as the goal was right before her eyes. Due to the enhanced forward rune, Nelfa couldn't reach them anymore. The spirit grandmasters had been pushed back by Noel. Keel had released her arrow to save her subordinates earlier and with Noel standing between them. It was impossible to shoot those two kids. Finally, after a long battle, Tristan and Sandra took a giant leap as they jumped over the bricks that separated the Greenwood Kingdom from the Atresca Kingdom. There was a huge sign of relief on Noel's face. Tristan and Sandra looked exhausted, but they felt a sense of accomplishment. After the chase that lasted for almost two weeks, Tristan and Chandra entered the Greenwood Kingdom. Chapter 844, Raincart. Tristan and Sandra finally crossed the border. When Noel saw that, 
he couldn't help but smile, realizing that this was going to end soon, he shouted, Dimitri. Dimitri understood what that shout was for and took a glimpse of Tristan and Sandra's positions. Got it, what got it? You won't be able to do anything before you reach the border city. Nervo shouted in anger while punching Dimitri. Once again, Dimitri turned into a shadow and moved toward Tristan and Sandra. Noel also did the same with the spirit grandmasters following him. TSK, Keel gritted her teeth but hadn't lost her will yet. She was the one telling Nelfa that Noel wouldn't be safe until he reached the border city where he could get some help. Chase him, don't let him go even further. Keel raised her bow and shot a few arrows into the sky. This time, she was planning to rain them down with multiple arrows. Exclamation mark Dimitri raised his head. Now that he was near the bricks, he couldn't feel anything that could protect them. There was a feeling that Noel was too optimistic about it to prove it. Dimitri rushed to the kids and waved his blade a few times, sending forth a few shadows to the sky to wrap the arrow before making it explode. Boom, boom, boom. A series of explosions occurred. Even after reaching the border, there was no barrier or whatever that would help them. In fact, not a single reinforcement was sent, making him think the plan had failed. This is the end, Dimitri. Nelfa arrived in front of him taking advantage of his focus on the arrows to deliver a huge damage on him. I don't have enough time to circulate my energy. Dimitri thought and chose to use his body as a shield. At the same time, he grabbed Tristan and Chandra before tossing them away so that they didn't get injured. What? Tristan and Sandra couldn't even react, but their faces became pale when they saw Dimitri was about to be punched by Nova. But before that fist could land on Dimitri's body, another palm struck the fist. Hell blaze! Exclamation mark. Both Nelfa and Dimitri were surprised that Noel managed to reach them. Noel's palm released a burst of black flame, trying to engulf Nelfa's entire arm. Nelfa could feel the intense flame despite not sensing a lot of heat from the undying flame. However, he also coated his arm with his spiritual energy and even turned it into steel. Do you think someone like you can easily block my fist? Nelfa roared as he released another burst of energy. Instead of dispelling the flame, he directed that energy to Noel's hand. Exclamation mark. Noel widened his eyes because this was the same thing as what happened during the training with Old Rue. He used that energy to shred his arm. In an instant, a few parts of his skin were sliced. Noel used his spiritual energy to counter that energy, but Nelfa's torrential energy was so explosive that it ended up knocking him back. Still, that burst of flame managed to stop Nelfa's punch from hitting Dimitri. The latter hurriedly waved his blade, but Nelfa easily avoided it by jumping to the side. The spirit grandmasters began looping around as Nelfa shouted, surround those two kids. Keel also shot out a few arrows to make Noel and Dimitri busy. It was possible to aim at them simultaneously now that they were close to each other. Master, Dimitri assessed the situation. Even if he could stop Nelfa and Keel, it would be hard to stop those devil bishops. He thought this would be over once they crossed the border, but it seemed that he had to use the true spirit body to cover them until they reached the border city. Looking at the incoming arrows, Noel remained calm as he said, Don't worry, Dimitri. The battle is over. The battle is over. You say? You must be blind because, Nelfa wanted to refute Noel. But before he finished his words, there were numerous spiritual energy fluctuations in the surrounding area. Exclamation mark. Bam, bam, bam. The ground started to tremble as a huge ice wall emerged from beneath the bricks that had been used as the border before. The wall was so tall that it reached the arrow's altitude and completely blocked them. Just from seeing how sophisticated other kingdoms' borders were, it should be weird to find the Greenwood Kingdom only had bricks as their borders. That was where Noel's confidence came from. It happened when Noel visited Tristan and Sandra. This is what I want you to do after reaching the next city. Noel handed Tristan a letter. A letter? Do we have to deliver this somewhere? No. I want you to use the kingdom's mailing service and use a lot of money to make this letter their priority. This letter will be the one saving us, so that means your role is important here. Can you do it? I understand. I will not disappoint you, master. Tristan nodded furiously before he fell silent while staring at the letter. Out of curiosity, he asked, if you don't mind. Can I know to whom this letter is addressed? At that time, Noel smiled as he stated the identity of that person. It's obvious. 
He is the former strongest court magician of the Greenwood Kingdom, Rain Cartenham, my grandfather. He was already frustrated with how the Ardigan family snatched his daughter from him. So, there was no way he would let a mere Supreme Devil organization kidnap his grandson. Without anyone realizing it, there was an old man appearing behind Tristan and Sandra. So, you two are the kids that he mentioned, you don't have to run anymore. Eh? Tristan and Sandra raised their heads. The old man had a gentle smile, but they could feel the hatred in his eyes. That hatred was directed at all the Grand Masters that tried to surround them. The old man was wearing a white robe and holding a staff. There was a blue jewel on the staff that let out a flickering light. The people from the organization furrowed their eyebrows, wondering who this old man was. Meanwhile, Nelfa might be the only one from the organization who could see through the old man's strength. His face became pale as he shouted, not good, run away, that shout startled everyone, but the old man replied with a cold tone, do you think you can run away? That cold tone somehow spread and turned into a cold atmosphere, rapidly lowering the temperature in the surrounding area. Before anyone could react, the old man hit the ground with the back of his staff, frozen world, a thick layer of ice was formed on top of the ground and spread in all directions instantly engulfing the devil bishop's feet as it spread all over their bodies and ultimately turning them into ice statues. Exclamation mark Nelfa widened his eyes in shock, he couldn't sense any life from the ice statues anymore as they suddenly crumbled into pieces, never in his wildest dream would an old man like this appear. With just a single tap of his staff, he actually froze an area in a hundred meter radius and killed eight spirit grandmasters, even if they weren't prepared. Dimitri didn't possess that kind of strength. With another tap of his staff, the old man disappeared. He, Nelfa instinctively smashed something on his left, albeit he found no one. All of a sudden, he felt a cold hand touching his right arm. Is this the one that injured my grandson? You don't need it anymore then. Ice formed and covered the entire arm. What? I reacted too late. Nelfa gritted his teeth. He had used his spiritual energy to stop the ice energy from freezing his entire body, but it actually reached up to his shoulder. More importantly, once his arm was covered in thick ice, it soon crumbled into pieces. You mere magician, Nelfa spun his body, trying to use his physical advantage to blow him away. But the old man actually moved faster than him and grabbed his face. He had even leapt on top of his body so that the punch missed. Do you think a magician can only shoot their power from behind? He snorted as he placed his hands on both Nelfa's face and chest. Boom, boom. Two explosions occurred as two arrows blasted through the ice wall, making it crumble. Nelfa knew Keel would be in his rescue, yet the old man only looked at the crumbling ice wall with an emotionless face. A mere terrorist dares to run rampant in my kingdom. There is only one outcome. He harumphed as he circulated his energy on both hands. Execute! Exclamation mark. Nelfa's body jolted before his eyes rolled upward until the black pupil disappeared completely. Before his body fell, a nice crystal appeared on the back of his head and chest. The old man used Nelfa's body as a cushion to land on the ground. Despite the frail old back, it somehow looked very sturdy and reliable. Even Dmitri and Noel didn't expect that he was this strong. The old man turned his head around with a smile. It's been a while, my little grandson. Chapter 845, Grandfather, it's been a while, my little grandson, Noel smiled. On the one hand, he was dumbstruck by his grandfather's power. On the other hand, he felt a bit helpless because he had to rely on someone else to solve his own problem. Let me take care of this. Raincart waved his hand. As he said those words, two more arrows blasted through the ice wall. Due to its position on the lower part. The huge blasts caused the entire wall to crumble, revealing what happened on the other side. Keel couldn't help but frown, never expecting that the situation had become like this. The spirit masters had died in the Atarukka kingdom, and the spirit grandmasters had all died in the Greenwood kingdom. Even though Nelfa was heavily injured, he was by no means weak. Yet, Nelfa couldn't hold a candle against Rain Cart. Keel maintained her silence, but it was clear that she had been defeated miserably, in fact. Not only did they lose a lot of devil inspectors and bishops, but they even lost one devil saint without being able to capture a single target. This might be the biggest loss they have suffered so far. 
More importantly, Dimitri hadn't used his true spirit body, meaning that he could directly rush to the Demon Banner army to inform them about the situation. They would definitely launch a massive counterattack when they knew that one of the Devil Saints had died. Raincart glared at her as if telling her, What? I'm merely killing the terrorist that invades my kingdom. It was something she couldn't refute. And with Dimitri there, she wouldn't have enough strength to resist both of them. Fortunately, Raincart was a former royal magician. Even though he had retired from his position, it didn't change the fact that his every move represented the country. If such a person entered the Atrika kingdom to chase after her, it would mean aggression to the Atrika kingdom. So, this time, Keel was lucky that she didn't cross the border earlier. I will remember this. Keel gritted her teeth before disappearing. Even if she said anything, it wouldn't change the outcome anyway. Raincart harumphed before waving his hand to the air, shooting a blue light that exploded after reaching a certain altitude. It seemed he was informing the rest of the people to take care of the situation. After that, Raincart turned around and walked to Noel, who looked a bit ashamed. Grandfather, Noel lowered his head, apologizing for the fact that he ended up forcing him to come here. Instead of getting angry, Raincart actually smiled and patted Noel's head. You've grown up, despite being chased by two peak grandmasters, you can still survive and even create a plan to kill one of them. I'm impressed. But, Noel bit his lips. He couldn't do that without relying on him, so Noel felt he didn't deserve that praise. Ha <laughs> ha. What kind of grandfather am I if I can't even help my cute grandson? Raincart chuckled. Instead of looking down, how about you accompany this retired old man for a while? You're not going back to the Muevel Kingdom immediately, right? Noel made a wry smile. He felt grateful and said, Yes, I'm planning to master my fire and directly break through to the spirit grandmaster. That is if grandfather doesn't mind me staying for a while. Good, good. Raincart nodded, satisfied. He glanced at Dimitri, saying, You've worked hard. Thank you, sir. Since master is with you, I can finally leave his side for the next plan. Thank you, Dimitri. Sorry for giving you this much burden. Noel also thanked him since Dimitri had been fighting against Nell for this whole time. Dimitri smiled before lowering his head to excuse himself. He turned back into the shadows and headed back to the Muevel Kingdom. Meanwhile, Raincart turned to the two kids and asked, Who are they? Let me introduce them. Noah looked proud. After all, Tristan and Sandre had completed all the ordeals and became the big reason why they could reach this place. This is Tristan, my disciple. He is learning rune from me. And this is Sandra, a maid in training. In fact, the only reason why I'm able to reach this far is because they have gone through dangerous ordeals to send that letter. Tristan couldn't help but smile because his dream had been achieved. Noel truly introduced him as his disciple to his grandfather. Even Sandra was praised a lot in that simple introduction. Is that so? Raincart patted the two kids' heads. Unfortunately, I didn't bring any gifts with me. So let's go back to the Enham family first. Yes, grandfather. Noel agreed without hesitation as he noticed a lot of soldiers coming to the area. A middle-aged man came to Raincart and said, Sir. Have you finished your business? Yeah, I'd have to trouble you in cleaning this up. The man looked at the mess and understood the assignment. At the same time, he also noticed Noel and the strength he possessed. He couldn't help but say, Congratulations, sir. What congratulations? This kid can't even stay in one place for a long time. Raincart harumphed, complaining about the fact that Noel didn't want to stay in his place. The man could only make a wry smile as he watched Raincart bring them away. While walking, Raincart couldn't help but watch Tristan and Sandra. Even though Noel introduced them as a maid in training and his disciple, their interaction looked closer. Raincart approached Noel and whispered, Be honest with me, do you have any woman you fancy over there? What do you mean? I don't have anyone like that. If I have one, she will end up getting targeted by the enemies. I still don't have enough strength to protect her or anything. Noel shook his head helplessly. Come on, you have become an adult. Normally, a noble child is already married one or two years before becoming an adult. Don't be like your father, who doesn't let me hold my kid until you're four years old. Raincart snorted. Noel was speechless. He didn't know why the topic suddenly turned into this. In any case, I'm not planning to have one soon because I'm still weak. Maybe after reaching Peak Grandmaster, I can finally do something about it. But not now. 
Instead of searching for a woman you need to protect, how about getting one that can protect you? Look at your mother, she is far stronger than your father. That's right, I have heard a few things about you from Damien. Raincart recalled for a moment. I heard that you have a close relationship with Anna Stargaze. Cough. Noel didn't expect that statement and said, What do you mean? You don't have to be shy. I've looked into it. She is the most talented woman in the Murville Kingdom. She indeed tried to execute you or something. But from the stories Damien told me, it seemed to be a misunderstanding. I heard that she is going to become an Arbiter soon since her fight against another Arbiter is happening soon. What? Noel knew that Anna was going to do it, but there were still a few months from the time limit. It looked like she was rushing, but at the same time, he thought Anna wanted to use the remaining time to solidify her position as an Arbiter. I think this girl is good and her father is your father's best friend. So, how about marrying her? Looking at the fact that she can already manifest the true spirit body means she might be the one protecting you. So, when are you going to get engaged with her? If you say you don't have enough standing after the fall of the Ardigan family, you can just use my Inham family to propose. Noel shook his head helplessly. Our relationship is not like that. Not like that. So, do you hate her or something? No, I don't hate her. Even though I still need an explanation from my father regarding the entire thing. I no longer hate her. Then, what is stopping you? Is she not beautiful enough? But isn't she one of the most beautiful ones in the Murville Kingdom? Her character? No. Do you like her in the first place? I think she is the only one who can stand beside you. Noel scratched the back of his head. He felt like his grandfather was interrogating him. It might be because he was frustrated by the questions that he tried to recall all his memories about Anna so that he could use them to counter Raincart's argument. But he ended up recalling the little bit they had, the game they completed together, and all the other small fighting. It was frustrating, annoying, tiring, and taxing. Yet, when he recalled those memories, they gave warmth, happiness, and comfort. Despite wanting to counter his grandfather's words, Noel ended up saying, she is beautiful. Anyone would definitely like her. In fact, I even admire her. She is not perfect, but she is always doing her best to become a better person. Then, Raincart became more interested when Noah looked so serious. He first urged him out of curiosity and desire, but it soon changed to a consultation. But, Noel couldn't help but remember the time Anna proposed a little bet followed by a peck on the cheek. He said helplessly, I feel like I will lose if I admit it. Besides, if we ever end up together, the royal family would make a huge fuss about it and we would be besieged from all directions. Eh? Raincart looked annoyed as if he didn't understand why such a small matter stopped him. You are too smart for your own good. Raincart patted his shoulder and said, sometimes, you don't have to think too much about that. It's just as simple as saying, I love you. You know, as a noble, you will get used to a political marriage. In fact, being able to say I love you to your partner is something that you should treasure dearly. This is advice from your grandfather. You might be smart, but there are problems that are so simple you can solve them just by being dumb. Don't think too much and just do it. Chapter 846, Situation Noel's arrival gave a huge shock to the entire Greenwood Kingdom. After the rune was popularized, it was said that Damien, the vice-captain of the Royal Army, had learned directly from Noah Lardigan. He then publicized the two unique ways of runes. The first one was the completed version of Spirit Enchantment. The Spirit Enchantment was basically a normal support rune that Noel usually used. But the most shocking thing was the second one, which was the Movement Rune. As a kingdom filled with spirit magicians, the Greenwood Kingdom had utilized the way of using their abilities far better than anyone else. By adding the Movement Runes into the mix, it was as if a human was given a pair of wings. There was a full-scale research conducted in the kingdom. Of course, Damien also told them about the rune body, but because he didn't get the secret from Noel, there was still not much movement regarding this type. With those achievements, Damien was promoted to a Marquis, but he chose to remain as the vice-captain of the Royal Army. And because of all those trips with Noel, Raincart caught Damien all the time forcing him to tell him about Noel. Obviously, Damien also got more information from Raincart, including the fact that he suddenly went to the border to get Noel. Upon finding out about Raincart's intention, 
Damien rushed to the royal palace. He was currently kneeling in front of the king, reporting the situation. The king raised his eyebrows, asking, Are you sure? Yes. I believe Sir Aincart is bringing Noel home at this time. I think he will be staying in this kingdom for a while. The king looked down, falling into deep thought. You said that it's impossible to entice him, right? Yes. From my observation, Noel Ardigan is not someone that can be enticed by money, status, or women. Coercion? Damien shook his head. The information from Commander Leon has stated that he managed to kill a peak spirit grandmaster with his plan. He himself has fought multiple masters and grandmasters. Back then, he and Anastages managed to take down a superior demon by themselves and with the speed of his progress. I'm afraid that we might suffer if we force him. Can't be enticed and forced. The king frowned. It was hard to deal with someone like this. On the one hand, he wanted to integrate Noel into this kingdom since the opportunity had arrived. On the other hand, he didn't know the method that could do it. They seemed to only have one path, which was a business relationship. The previous one was extremely beneficial, so it wasn't that bad of an option. But before he made a decision, Damien added, that's right. In the report from Commander Leon, it's said that he has brought two kids from the Atrika kingdom. I don't think he will kidnap someone with high status, so I'm assuming that they are either commoners or slaves. Hmm, that kind of slave? I don't think so. It seems that the two slaves have a good relationship, but we're not aware of their relationship with Noel. Slaves. Commoners. Two kids. The king fell into deep thought. He felt that their relationship was more complicated than he originally thought. After considering countless possibilities, the king had arrived at three possibilities, and he had just found out another way to cooperate with Noel. What is he planning to do in this kingdom? I'm not sure, but if I have to take a guess, he has told me that he is planning to become a spirit grandmaster soon. That answer was what the king just needed. That's right. He can't be enticed by those things or forced, right? What if he is the one requesting it? The king smirked as if he had just gotten a weird idea. He waved his hand, asking Damien to come closer. Damien was confused, but when the king whispered to him his plan, Damien couldn't help but gasp. What? Damien couldn't believe what he heard. However, the king only added, you are in charge of it, go. Damien thought that the king had gone insane, but at the same time, he couldn't deny the possibilities. The Greenwood Kingdom wasn't the only one who got busy. There was a huge storm brewing in the Muevel Kingdom. Dimitri was sitting in front of the commander himself with Malfa standing between them as if trying to mediate the discussion. Dimitri and Oscar were glaring at each other. To think you know how to come back, Dimitri. Oscar squinted his eyes, judging Dmitri's action in leaving the demon banner army, it seems that you only care about that petty thing, I didn't break any rules nor the army forbade me from leaving, Dmitri snorted, if you're gonna talk about this thing, then there is no need to hand this gift, gift, Oscar was confused, thinking Dmitri wasn't someone who would give another person a present, it's just a me thanks for taking care of the kids. Well, I should hand this gift to Milfa instead of you. Dimitri harumphed and tossed a box to Milfa. Milfa caught it carefully, not understanding what this box meant. Can I open it? Milfa asked. Suit yourself. Milfa put down the box on the table and opened the lids. She was surprised by a lot of heads inside the box. Wah! Milfa jumped back while looking at the box with a disgusted face. Mentor, even if this is a prank, this is not funny. It seems that you have been around Oscar too much that you've become too soft. Dimitri shrugged. Milfa also thought Dimitri would scare her like this, so she took another glance at the heads before widening her eyes. This is. Milfa gasped. What's wrong, Milfa? Oscar frowned, feeling something wasn't right. He shouldn't have died for a long time, so the energy is still lingering in his body. But even though it has been weakened for quite a bit, if I'm not wrong, this person should be a peak spirit grandmaster. Wait a minute, mentor, didn't you go to the Atrika kingdom earlier, and the supreme devil organization chased you? Don't tell me, this person. Dimitri shrugged. There are also around ten devil bishops and dozens of devil inspectors. Unfortunately, that old hag didn't die. A devil saint? Milfa sucked a cold breath, never expecting Noel and Dimitri to be able to subdue a devil saint. They were chased by two devil saints after all. Old hag. Keel. Oscar frowned for another matter. 
Keel was known to be a strategist on top of her strength. With her leading the operation, it was impossible to escape unless they managed to outsmart her or outnumber her. The latter was impossible since Noel and Dimitri were the only ones. Dimitri couldn't outsmart Keel as well. In other words, the one who made this possible was none other than Noel. In any case, that person is called Nelfa. He is also a devil saint. His body is as tough as steel. Even with my full power, I can't cut him down. Dimitri snorted. You should be overjoyed with this gift, right? Spare me some more demon crystals. Didn't you say this is a gift? Oscar gritted his teeth. Did I say something like that? I'm not sure. My blood was boiling earlier, so it might have affected my memory. Dimitri rolled his eyes. Oscar let out a long sigh while covering his face with his hands. He added, just talk to Milfu about that. If you have nothing to say, just leave. That's what I'm planning to do. Dimitri immediately stood up, expressing his unwillingness to stay one more second than he needed to be. Milfo didn't know what to do other than give a wry smile before accompanying Dimitri outside. Mentor, thank you for the gift, it's fine. I'm just doing my job. Job, are you trying to imply that we're incompetent? Well, whatever, thanks to you, we can start our counter-attack. The organization should be chaotic after losing a devil saint. Instead of thanking me, you should thank him. Ah, you can handle the transferring process, right? Yes, I can. But transferring? Is there anyone wanting to change their squad? Melfa tilted her head in confusion. Here you go. Dimitri handed a letter that contained Noel's plan. Just follow this. How are the kids? Milfa received it carefully and put it in her pocket. She explained. They are doing fine. No, even better. They are freaks. Most of them are already spirit apprentices. Do you have any opinion about them going to our territory? With our counter-attack, the organization should lay low for a moment. So, your territory should be safe for a while. Milfa shook her head, giving the approval. All right then. There is nothing I need to do in this place. By the way, I think I need to tell you about these two things. There is a movement from the third prince and the royal family. I'm afraid that the organization is behind this. Dimitri frowned, asking, Do you mean that the organization has made contact with the third prince and the royal family? There is no evidence yet. What about the second one? Anastages is about to become an arbiter. Chapter 847, Connections, in the corner of the Muevil Kingdom. The third prince was staring at the city from his balcony, the city was filled with people, and there were a lot of smiles on the street, it looked peaceful, the atmosphere was good, and the situation seemed to be under control, but while he was enjoying the little peace he had, the third prince suddenly opened his mouth while saying with a cold tone, this is not the place where you belong, a mysterious figure appeared in his room, he spoke, don't forget that both you and the royal family are within our grasp. You, royals, have been using us to control the kingdom. It's time for you to pay back. It seems the dogs are planning to bite its owner's hands. The third prince squinted his eyes and turned around, recognizing the person. Law Fiardigan. Don't forget that the reason why you can enter the Ardigan family was thanks to my late father, the former king. Dogs. Lorfi narrowed his eyes as his energy started to leak out of his body. Lorfi waved his hand, causing his energy to burst. Exclamation mark. The third prince was launched to the edge of the balcony, he would have fallen if not for the railing. What are you doing? I'm merely putting you in your place. Lorfi snorted. He tossed a letter to the third prince and said, This is your instruction. If you don't do it, then don't blame us for destroying your influence. The third prince gritted his teeth, glaring at Lorfi, who immediately disappeared after delivering the letter. Just like the third prince, the current king also had a visit, but this visit came from none other than the strongest devil saint, Alexander. Inside a hidden chamber, the king, accompanied by a man in his fifties, sat in front of Alexander. Despite facing a spirit transcendence, the king didn't show any sign of fear because the man next to him was exuding an aura that was equal to Alexander's. Yes, he was the current marshal of the Muevil Kingdom, the spirit transcendence that the royal family possessed. Alexander smirked when he saw the marshal standing in his way. He said, to think the little boy back then has become a spirit transcendence and a marshal. You didn't come here just to talk about that, right, Alexander? The king squinted his eyes. Oh, come on, it was I who helped you become the king, Alexander smirked. 
Do you think I'm not aware that you are also using my brother? The king snorted. There was only one person who could be called brother by the current king. He was none other than the third prince. Looking at the situation, the organization seemed to have contacted the third prince as well. I don't have time for this. I have to handle a lot of other things. Alexander paused for a moment before raising two fingers. It's pretty simple. We want no Aladagon. The king narrowed his eyes. Oh, my. Is the kingdom really lacking that they couldn't even find out that no Aladagon is still alive? Alexander sounded it that way. But the only reason why Alexander knew Noel was because of Lorfi. Other than a handful of people, Noel's identity hadn't been known at all. Still, the king couldn't show that weakness. He kept his poker face and said, I'm merely thinking about the possibility of you using Noel Ardigan. There is no reason why the organization wants Noel Lardigan after all. Don't forget that it was I who eliminated the Ardigan family. What we are planning to do is not your business. Alexander pointed to the second finger. The next demand is exiling Noel Lardigan. The king frowned. From the looks of it, Noel seems to have gotten pretty big under another alias. And it was so big that exiling was an option. Normally, there was no need to exile a commoner since the latter had no power to fight back. But it seemed that Noel's situation was bigger than he thought. Of course, he had heard about the rune book as well. But because he was under the impression that Noel had died, he only tried to research the book. Since the organization wanted him to exile Noel, it meant they wanted to capture or kill Noel Ardigan. He had eliminated the Ardigan family and his parents, so he thought there was no need to worry about Noel that much. But considering he had become another threat that might reach his father's level, he had to take another approach in this matter. He said, you should know that exiling is not a small matter because if the royal family exiles a mere commoner, we will be looked down upon. Of course. So, I'll tell you a piece of information. Noel Ardigan is going to become a noble soon. Exclamation mark. The king fully understood what Alexander meant. The exile could be done simply by giving Noel a new territory instead of his former territory. And that territory should be harsh. I will consider it and give you the answer soon. I have to handle the matter of arbiters first. Then, I will be looking forward to a good result. Alexander politely bowed his head before disappearing from the room. Meanwhile, the king's calm expression turned into anger. The marshal was sweating as he couldn't help but ask, Are we going to follow the terrorists' demand? Do you think they can control me? They are just the dogs of the kingdom. Do you think I don't know that four out of twelve arbiters have switched to their sides? The king became even more frustrated, unlike the demon banner army who had been strict in their selection ever since Lorfi's incident. The royal family had a hard time managing the arbiters. Are you planning? The marshal frowned. Yeah, I know that former Count Erdan has cooperated with the organization. It's time to replace him. The marshal's face turned grim, fully aware of what the king was planning to do. There was only one person who could replace him. It was Anna. Anna was meditating in her room preparing for the battle that was going to happen two days later. She had been in the capital for a week. It only took her one week after that trip to become a spirit grandmaster. And she finally challenged Count Erdan for revenge on what happened in the Creek Village. As expected, the capital was filled with danger. Her instinct was telling her that there was an extremely powerful man just leaving the capital. That feeling was similar to what she felt during the mission in Creek Village. That devil saint, ha! As expected, the royal family is connected to them. It might be a secret from the public, but when one grew stronger and could see the entire kingdom with their strength, they were bound to realize that the kingdom had actually created the organization to control the kingdom. In other words, it wouldn't be that hard to know that the royal family or the exiled member had made contact with the organization. Even Noel could see through it completely. However, there was simply no proof to prove it. Anna had come to this conclusion as well. Still, why didn't my previous life realize this? Was it because of my ignorance? No, was it because I was created to be ignorant? Anna could see how her teacher and the royal family made her blind, forcing her to follow orders. More importantly, there was another question when she realized the relationship between the royal family and the Supreme Devil organization. If someone like me can see their relationship, the previous life Noel should have seen through it too. In other words, he should have known all about the connection of the third prince, the royal family, and the organization. Yet, Anna recalled the last moment they had together, 
she and Noel ended up falling into an ambush. The third prince betrayed Noel when the latter should have been aware of the third prince's true nature. Wait a minute. Anna suddenly remembered what happened after Noel sacrificed himself during the fight against the superior demon. At that time, Noel had a medicine that allowed him to recover from such a fatal wound. Don't tell me, Noel used that precious medicine to make the third prince believe he is dead? But didn't he get something from old Rue and cause me to regress? Why did he do that? Why did he allow me to die if he actually wanted me to form a connection with him? I still believe that having him regress would be a better choice than me. But why did he choose the option where both of us died that day? Why? Anna couldn't answer the doubt in her mind. At the same time, the current Noel wouldn't have the answer. Considering they had taken a different path, this might be the puzzle the previous Noel had created. If she managed to solve it, she might be able to know why Noel chose her instead of himself. Ha! You bastard. Anna pinched her forehead and added, Both the previous and the current Noel are a pain in the ass. None of them can just tell me straight. Why bother using riddles? Whatever. I will repay the previous Noel by solving this riddle. As for the current one, Anna fell into deep thought. On the one hand, the memories she had with the current Noel were far different from the past. There was simply no hatred between them. In fact, they could trust each other with their life. On the other hand, she felt like their relationship wasn't that simple. This thought reminded her of Noel's plan. I want to become a noble. She could remember Noel's voice vividly. A noble, huh? What would happen after that? Does he want to become a noble just to be killed? But this time, there is no second chance. In the previous life, it's gone bad because of me. And in this life, he wants us to tackle the problem together? Well, it's true that I feel like no one can rival us if we're together. But, Anna scratched the back of her head. If I propose this, won't that mean I've lost the purpose of my life? Anna had been controlled by everyone, including Noel, in her previous life. In this life, she obviously wanted to take her own path, free from others. But there was no denying that Noel had a big impact on her life. She just didn't know anymore. Ugh. The more I think about it, the bigger the headache. Whatever, I'm just going with this until I see another variable. Anna clenched her fists. Just you wait, Noel. Whatever you're planning, I'm going to surpass it. Chapter 848, Match. Right outside the capital city, there was a huge line of people trying to enter. The mood inside the city was filled with excitement as though they were preparing a huge celebration. The people were cheering at each other, showing their enthusiasm. The heart of this festive mood came from a huge stadium inside the city. This stadium was used only for a huge celebration where they gathered a huge number of people to witness. And this time, it wasn't that different. The people were filling up the stadium to the brim. We can't miss this. That's right. I would never think that I could witness something like this. Look, in the middle of the stadium was built a huge arena. But it would be dangerous for the people if the arena wasn't protected. That was why there were a total of 20 pillars that circled the arena. On top of each pillar stood a powerful man, releasing their spiritual energy to form a barrier. However, there were four pillars that had yet to be filled. One of the people suddenly pointed at the northern pillar. A man suddenly stepped on the pillar, causing the cheers to erupt. Whoa, isn't that? The one who stepped forth was a middle-aged man. He had a muscular body and sharp eyes. There was a claw scar that ran through his right eyebrows to the right cheeks. Everyone seemed to recognize him as they began shouting his identity. Count Zerin. You ooh ooh. The fire arbiter is here. Count Zerin. Fire arbiter. That was right. He was one of the twelve arbiters of the kingdom. Hawk Zerin, known as Fire Arbiter. However, the cheers soon swept the arena once again as another person appeared on the west pillar. The people couldn't help but stop for a moment as if they were getting entranced by her beauty. The woman looked like she was in her late twenties. She had long red hair and an expression devoid of emotion. But that was exactly her charm. She looked aloof and cool, like a flower that could only be admired from afar. As expected, she is also coming, well, it can't be helped. She is after all a teacher. That's right, the Void Arbiter, Josephine Brown. That was right. The person who just appeared was none other than Anna's teacher, Josephine. As her teacher, it would be weird if she wasn't here. However, the people didn't know that their relationship wasn't like what they were thinking. Josephine had been brainwashing Anna while the latter actually had figured out her trick and acted like she was a good student. It only took a moment before the cheers changed once again. 
This time, the person who came was an old man. At first glance, there was nothing special about this man. However, the more they looked at him, the more they felt the difference. When they made eye contact, they felt like they were being cut by numerous swords. He was the most senior arbiter and known to be the strongest. Uh, the sword arbiter has taken the stage. Duke Lorelei, I'm glad that I'm attending this fight. I can see all these famous figures by myself, but there is one more spot that hasn't been filled yet. But the sword arbiter has taken the stage first. So, the last one should be someone more famous than him, right? Is it the marshal? You idiot. You shouldn't forget about the fighter this time. That's right. If it's sir, then her father must be going. As people said those words, the last figure landed on the pillar. As everyone had expected, since the challenger was his daughter, there was no way he wouldn't come. Ooh. Marquis Stargaze, the fleeting arbiter has taken the stage. As expected, he is going to watch his daughter. Who do you think will win? Count Ed and my twin this time. After all, he has been an arbiter for two decades. Meanwhile, his opponent is someone who hasn't lived for two decades. You idiot. That's exactly the reason why Count Erdan can't let his guard down. The fact that his challenger is that talented means she has a trump card that can defeat him. That's possible. While they were discussing the match, a loud voice suddenly swept the arena. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm sure that you can't wait for this match, so I'll spare you from a long opening speech. Let me introduce you to the people who will protect you and become the witness of this amazing fight. The first one is Count Zerin, known as the Fire Arbiter. I'm sure you've known him by his nickname, Fire Demon. It came from the fight where he pushed back an army of 10,000 demons with the knights from his territories. The second person is none other than our challenger's teacher. Her space element is unmatched in this kingdom. You can't escape when she has set her eyes on you. The Void Arbiter, Josephine Brown. You might already know the third person as he is the oldest arbiter and the one with the longest career as an arbiter. In this world, there is nothing he can't cut. The Sword Arbiter, Duke Lorelei. Last but not least, as a father and as an arbiter, there is no way he will pass this fight. The arbiter who has defeated more bandits than anyone else the protector of the kingdom, holding the title of fleeting, Marquis Stargaze. You, uh, 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 the people cheered while clapping their hands. Without further ado, I will be introducing you to the two people that will fight today. For our challenger, we have someone extremely special. She is recognized as the most talented person in the Muvel Kingdom. She is the student of the Void Arbiter as well as the daughter of the Fleeting Arbiter. In her early career, she joined the Demon Banner Army and graduated earlier than all her comrades. She has broken the record as the strongest person to graduate from the training camp. In the Kingdom, she has surpassed everyone's record. She is only 19 years old, but she has become a spirit grandmaster. No one can surpass this record anytime soon. In order to get the right to challenge an arbiter, she had to complete three missions. The first one was to gain recognition from at least six arbiters. The second one was to eliminate a hundred peak level demons, which she completed pretty easily. The last one was to defeat a superior demon by herself. It seemed that the sword arbiter, the fleeting arbiter, and the fire arbiter were there as her witness. I'm sure that you can't wait anymore. After all, she is known to be one of the most beautiful women in the kingdom. Without further ado, let's invite Anna Stargaze. The cheers erupted once again as a figure walked into the arena. Just like with Josephine, the people were stunned. Her blonde hair had been tied into a ponytail, creating a gallant toro around her. Her sharp eyes could freeze anyone on the spot. She was wearing a white-colored military uniform, complementing her bright hair. Her expression was calm and collected as if she wasn't afraid of the person that would fight her. When she stepped on the stage, another wave of cheers burst. You, uh, uh, Anna Stargaze. She is so beautiful, to think that she is that strong already. Who would actually be her match? The announcer shifted their attention again by introducing her opponent. On the opposite side, I think everyone has known him. He has been an arbiter for 20 years. His achievements are so many that I can't list all of them for you. He is the Earth Arbiter, Count Erden. An old man walked to the stage. Just like Anna, he was wearing a similar uniform. While he was keeping a calm expression, the Count had fully understood why he was chosen. On the surface, it looked like revenge from Anna. 
but the royal family definitely knew that he had been cooperating with the Supreme Devil Organization to cripple the Demon Banner Army. To avoid any further problems, the royal family was planning to use this fight to replace his position. After that, they could simply frame them with anything before subjugating his family. That was why Count Erden knew that he couldn't lose in this fight if he wanted his family to be safe. When he reached the stage, his eyes made contact with Anna's. He couldn't help but furrow his eyebrows, thinking, she is far different from back then. But they couldn't intimidate their opponents any longer as both of them had to turn their bodies around, facing a small balcony that was isolated from the rest. Even the arbiters on the pillar faced the balcony. They all suddenly dropped to one knee as the announcer shouted, His Majesty, Oliver Vlenforth, is entering the arena! Exclamation mark. From their action to the announcement, the other people also followed suit. The king of the Muevil Kingdom had just entered his spot, standing on his balcony while looking at the arena. He was accompanied by the marshal, who would protect him from all kinds of threats. He announced, This is a battle between the young talent and the old reliable arbiter. I'll spare you with the speech. The rule is simple. Do your best to defeat your opponent without killing them. I don't wish for the talent of my kingdom to be destroyed right before my eyes. The true spirit body is forbidden. The four arbiters will protect the people so you can fight to the best of your abilities. I wish you good luck. As he finished his speech, he sat down while squinting his eyes, watching Anna closely. This was the piece he wanted to get the most. Unfortunately, he couldn't state it openly. He waved his hand, as if signaling the announcer to begin the match. Everyone began to stand up, fully knowing what would happen next. They couldn't contain their excitement anymore. With an energetic tone, the announcer finally said, with his majesty's permission, let me announce it to everyone. The battle between Count Erden and Anna Stargaze. Officially starts. Chapter 849, Anna vs Erden. Officially starts. The moment they heard it, both Erden and Anna released their spiritual energy. The eruption of their energy caused a massive shockwave that soon clashed with each other, creating immense pressure on the field. The dust was pushed to the wall, the ground began to shake, and the people had a hard time breathing. In that moment, the four arbiters as well as the experts who had been invited to protect the pillar, began releasing their spiritual energy, creating a barrier to block everything from reaching them. Ha! There were a lot of pantings among the audience as they were gasping for air, the announcer explained excitedly, I'm sure that you've felt it as well. Their power seems to be equal and we'll definitely be able to see a great match, determining whether Count Erden could remain in his position or get replaced by Anastar Gaze. It seemed that they deliberately allowed both of them to pressure the citizens to showcase their power. This would give them knowledge about the power of an arbiter, not just by seeing it but also by experiencing it. After that brief clash, the pressure died down. Anna took out her sword while Erden raised both hands. Rocks soon appeared out of nowhere, covering his entire arm. Their eyes flashed as both of them leapt forward. Anna waved her blade straight to Erden's neck while the latter raised his hand, blocking the sword. A clicking sound echoed. It was hard for a blade to cut down a rock, especially when both of them were coated by the same amount of energy. However, Anna stomped the ground, using her lower body to gain a surge of strength before transferring it to her hand. Ha! She roared, exerting strength three times more than she previously used. Exclamation mark. Even Erdan didn't expect such power to come from her frail body. He tried to stop the blade, but the force was too much for him to handle, causing his body to spin upside down. Even though he was old, it didn't mean that his body was already too stiff to move. He skillfully used his hands to stand while covering his right foot with the rock before kicking Anna. Anna blocked the kick with her sword, avoiding direct contact with her body. But she ended up jumping back to dodge the force contained in that kick. After that, Eden spun his body again and stood back up as if nothing happened. He even looked more confident, thinking Anna wasn't his opponent yet. You were amazing to be able to become a spirit grandmaster at that age, and you're not an average grandmaster either. But. Erdan thought as his expression turned grim. Dot I can't afford to lose this battle. Since he had knocked her back earlier, Erdan leapt forth, taking the initiative to launch his attack. On the one hand, Anna would be able to overwhelm him with the rune drawn on her body. On the other hand, she couldn't expose it because it would just show her affiliation with Noel. Hence, Anna gathered her power in her left hand, 
the lightning began to spark as she stomped the ground to get another surge of strength before grasping Eden's fist. Eden covered his entire body with the rock and took Hannah's lightning directly. The lightning tried to electrocute Eden, but the rock blocked it and channeled it to the ground. Anna looked at the clash calmly before jumping back once again as if she had been pushed back. But surprisingly, Eden also stopped on his track while looking at his hand. The rock managed to block the lightning, but a portion of it seemed to be able to penetrate the rock. He was sure of it because his hand had gotten numb. It seemed that Anna was stronger than he expected and this was just getting started. He changed Anna's threat level to someone who could actually defeat him. Getting serious, Eden placed his hand on the ground. Saw. Suddenly, the ground shook violently as four dragon heads emerged. They were made of rock and moved up and down. They even returned back to the floor before coming back out as if the ground was just water. These four dragon heads moved toward Anna, surrounding her from all directions. Anna jumped into the air as the four dragons followed her. One of them sped up and opened its mouth to swallow her, but Anna skillfully stepped on its teeth before jumping to the side. As expected, another dragon came from a different direction. Fortunately, Anna managed to rotate her body and jump again. Eden controlled the dragons carefully, trying to surround Anna. Seeing Anna being toyed with by Eden couldn't help but disappoint the people. They came here because Anna looked capable. If she managed to defeat Eden, it would cause an uproar. Unfortunately, it seemed she was still too young to fight against an arbiter. Anna Stargaze can only be on the defensive. As expected, is it going to be a one-sided match? The announcer asked aloud before noticing something. Wait a minute. Look at Anna Stargaze. She is. The announcer was tongue-tied because of the shock. When the people tried to understand what he was saying, they were stunned as well. Exclamation mark. Even Eden dropped his jaw in disbelief. She is actually closing her eyes, that was right, the thing that shocked everyone was the fact that Anna shut her eyes, she looked calm and undisturbed, relying on his instinct to read the dragon's movements, Eden had launched an all out attack, but for Anna, this was not even worth mentioning, without anyone realizing it, Anna had actually sheathed her sword, you brat, Eden gritted his teeth, out of anger, he fully controlled one of the dragons, speeding it up, the dragon somehow got even bigger to the point there was no way Anna could avoid it unless she could fly. But that was the time Anna finally opened her eyes. As she opened her eyes, her hand drew her blade, releasing the energy she had been gathering this whole time. The draw happened in an instant and the next thing they realized, there was an energy wave that sliced the dragon's head into two. Exclamation mark. The people were completely dumbstruck. Anna had just cut a dragon's head that was as big as a two-story building. The remaining energy was still traveling toward the audience, only to strike the barrier. Rumble. The barrier seemed to shake for a split second before it neutralized the energy. Out of the people that maintained the barrier, only the sword Darbiter understood the degree of mastery Anna had. What? The sword Darbiter looked at the trace of energy while muttering inwardly. That slash alone is carrying a sharp energy. Is she able to change the property of her energy to match her intent? After watching Noel's swordsmanship for a long time as well as the experience she had in her previous life, Anna managed to understand the concept of the sword. The current her could actually decide whether the sword could actually cut or not, similar to Noel's ever-changing emotion sword style but limited to only sharp and blunt. After cutting the dragon head, Anna rotated her body seeing the dumbfounded Eden. When their gazes met, Eden regained his composure and hurriedly controlled the remaining three dragons. After releasing such a strike, Anna should be vulnerable. Seeing the three incoming heads, Anna turned out to be gathering her lightning in her hand as if she didn't plan to release such a power anymore. She pushed her hand forward, releasing the lightning forth, to everyone's surprise. The lightning spread like branches and formed a hand. It looked like a bone, but it still served its job. The hand grabbed a dragon's head as Anna pulled herself toward the dragon, avoiding the other two. Before reaching the dragon in front, Anna released another sword strike to sever the dragon's neck, causing its head to fall down. Anna skillfully landed on top of the dragon's head, using it as a cushion. Yet, two meters away from the floor, Anna actually used the lightning hand to toss the dragon's head to Eden while landing on the ground gracefully. Eden stomped the ground forming a few walls. The dragon's head crushed a few walls before ultimately stopping at the last third wall. Although the attack was a failure, it still gave Eden a scare. 
Anna examined her attack and the two incoming dragons that were trying to distract her. This time, she tossed the sword into the air and gathered a huge amount of energy in both hands as she grabbed both heads before releasing all that energy in one go. The lightning was rampaging on the heads, shattering the rocks into pieces. Now that the nuisance had gone, Anna grabbed the falling sword and stood firmly. Her lightning was covering her body as if it was alive. With a confident face, Anna looked at Erden as though she was saying, the battle's just started. Overconfident brat. Erden gritted his teeth while releasing more and more energy from his body. Chapter 850. Awakening. Erden rushed forward while covering his entire body with rock. Anna wasn't afraid of him and made the same move. When they were about to reach each other, Anna waved her blade, using the lightning to drastically increase his speed. Erden instinctively realized that this swing was more dangerous than the one he had seen before. He hurriedly raised his right hand, catching the blade. The energy around Anna's sword burst, stopping him from closing his palm to grab her sword. Since it was useless, Erden changed his tactics by stomping the ground. Exclamation mark. Anna suddenly felt her body become alight. It turned out Erden stomped the ground to turn it into a crater. He used that split second where her body wasn't on the ground to punch her. Erden had even used his rock to attach himself to the floor, allowing him to move his body freely. Anna clicked her tongue and created a bolt of lightning on the side, trying to blast the stone fist. To everyone's surprise, the lightning suddenly burst out, launching Anna with its shock wave. What? Erden was surprised and turned around, finding Anna at the edge of the arena. Did she use her own lightning to propel herself? She's judged that my attack hurts more than her power. He had seen a lot of insane people, but he never thought that Anna would rather injure herself instead of allowing his attack to land on her body. As a result, Anna escaped with only a minor bruise. Eden didn't plan to let Anna control the pace of the battle. He placed his hands on the ground as the floor and the wall formed a whip that caught Anna's wrists and ankles. Still, Eden didn't know anything about Anna's spirit link. Her instinct warned her about the incoming danger, including these rocks. She skillfully jumped forth, avoiding Eden's attack. After that, she used the angle of the crater to jump toward Eden. The moment he saw Anna's sword was sheathed again, he immediately formed multiple walls between himself and Anna, thinking, that attack is coming. He didn't deny the fact that Anna's sword strike was so strong that he would die if he wasn't careful. However, this was what Anna wanted from the start. The moment the walls blocked Erden's vision, Anna covered her entire body with lightning. After that, she rotated her body and ended up kicking the wall. Oldru had taught her how to control her spiritual energy. She used that lesson to concentrate the spiritual energy on her shoe. The wall couldn't stand a chance against Anna's concentrated energy. This was even stronger than the cut because she could concentrate everything on a single point instead of making a big slash. What? Eden was surprised when he felt his walls were getting destroyed. Her movement was like a spear that could penetrate all armor and shields. However, she wasn't the only one who was shocked by it. Even Anna's father couldn't help but gasp, thinking, since when can my daughter concentrate that amount of energy into a single point? Josephine frowned, having a different thought. Her control over spiritual energy is so exquisite. I haven't taught her anything like that. Yet. The fire arbiter frowned. He had a similar ability to Anna, but there was a big difference. He muttered. Her spiritual energy is completely empty all over her body. Normally. It's impossible to do that as the body leaks spiritual energy. But she actually manages to control that leaking energy and gather them in a single point. The sword arbiter smirked feeling challenged. It seems that Erden will have a hard time. No, I could say that the chance of him winning has decreased to 50%. He should feel lucky that Anastarges is forbidden to use the true spirit body, or he would have no chance of winning. Just like the four arbiters, the marshal could see through Anna's profound skill. This is. Is there something wrong? The king asked. Her control even puts me to shame. No, should I say that her control is extremely unique? Is it that amazing? The king didn't know because he wasn't a spirit grandmaster. Amazing is an understatement. The marshal shook his head helplessly. There are two known methods of controlling spiritual energy. The soft approach and the hard approach. The former is focused on the flow of spiritual energy, allowing the user to fully direct the spiritual energy. But our body is naturally releasing that much energy to the point that it's impossible for soft control to direct everything into a single point. 
Yet, she is able to do it. It looks like she is directing the spiritual energy before the body even releases it. I can't completely explain it, but you can think of her entire body as a bridge that can change direction depending on her needs. More importantly, that strength also contains the explosive power from the hard approach. By directing all the leaking spiritual energy, she can use the original spiritual energy to cover her foot. In other words, all those leaking spiritual energy can be stored in her foot and shot again and again. The king looked at the amazement on his marshal's face. He never thought that a spirit transcendence like him would praise Anna that highly. It seemed that he had to re-evaluate Anna not long ago. He had been trying to force Anna to marry the crown prince for the stability of the kingdom. Sadly, she managed to defeat all his plans, hence, he was considering another approach, instead of forcing her. It appeared that befriending her would give a lot of benefits, including that profound control. The closer they were, the more Anna would let her guard down. And when the time was ripe, he would make Anna submit completely. But this also reminded him of the Supreme Devil Organization. It would be bad if the Supreme Devil Organization chose to capture Anna. He said, after this battle is over, go to Alexander and tell him that I accept his condition. I will exile Noah Lardigan, but in exchange, the Supreme Devil Organization is not allowed to do anything to Anna Stargaze. The Marshal's expression turned serious. Understanding what the decision meant, he bowed to him. I understand. The battle continued. Once Anna showed her superb control, the battle started to shift in her favor. Ed tried to stop her by multiple walls, even from the sides, to stop her momentum. But Anna simply increased her speed and slipped past them. Ultimately, Eden was forced to use those four dragon heads again, even though it required a lot of spiritual energy. While Anna could destroy them with her kick alone, the dragon's size made it hard for her to do that. Once she got swallowed, the rock would lock her up, so she changed her strategy back to her sword. After learning about Anna's capability, Eden controlled the heads carefully, aware that one wrong move would give Anna the opportunity to cut them down. He tried to surround Anna and retreat when Anna was about to sheathe her sword. Anna could feel the threat appearing and disappearing all the time due to the change in Erdan's intention. Even then, Anna couldn't cut them down easily. As expected of an arbiter, he is strong. In the past, I challenged the fire arbiter instead of him. But it's clear that he is stronger than the fire arbiter. No, should I say that his strength is around ranked 6th to 8th among all arbiters? Anna examined the situation. She had understood the strength of Arbiters since her previous life. There were only twelve of them, but each of them was so strong that they became the pillars of this kingdom, preventing the Demon Banner Army and the Tower Association from taking control of the kingdom's matters. I can't use my true spirit body and runes at the moment. But he is not someone I can defeat without putting everything on the line. Anna took a deep breath before making her decision. It seems that I have to reveal this sooner than expected. Anna suddenly stopped moving for a second and even closed her eyes. Eden was confused, but he didn't let this chance go. The four dragons tried to distract her, but before they managed to reach her, Anna had opened her eyes again. Her purple eyes had turned light blue like that of lightning. Her blonde hair started sparking as a portion of it turned white. She opened her mouth as lightning even sparked between her lips. She was transforming her body into lightning. Oi, Bazooka, are you ready? Anna said inwardly. It seemed that her spirit also responded to her. There was only one fit reply to their relationship. Don't cry if your body can't handle my power. Hey. Anna smirked as she stepped forth. A burst of lightning scattered in all directions, cracking the heads from its sheer pressure alone. There was one thing that Anna had prepared before this battle. After returning from her trip to Old Drew, Anna and Noel had made an agreement with the former royal alchemist and received a pill that could forcefully awaken their spirit. Noel didn't eat the pill right away for an unknown reason, but she ingested the pill, allowing the spirit link to further develop. She used that spirit link to become a true host of the spirit, allowing her spirit's true power to flow in her veins, which caused her body to partly become lightning. Awakening on, Anna stomped the ground before jumping forward with a speed far surpassing anything she had shown so far. The shockwave mixed with her lightning and shattered the dragon heads as Anna made her way to Eden. Chapter 851, Raging Lightning Descend. What? Eden gasped as he instinctively thickened the layer of rocks that protected his skin to the point where he looked like a golem instead of a human. 
After that, he raised both hands, trying to stop Anna's blade. Anna utilized the momentum as well as the fierce lightning to strike Aiden. She wanted to know how much strength she could muster by this awakening. Obviously, the power of the awakening was not at the same level as the true spirit body, but the pill had transformed the spirit links, including her veins, to a level where her body could assimilate with the spirit itself. When her blade struck Eden's blade, the spiritual energy erupted, the lightning was rampaging on the area, shattering the ground even further, the rampant lightning also bounced toward the barrier, exclamation mark her father, Kevin, couldn't help but increase the output of his spiritual energy as the barrier began to tremble, Kevin looked at his daughter and sucked a cold breath, since when has my daughter become this strong, no. What is she doing the whole time? Not only the control but also this transformation. Kevin thought Anna had done something unprecedented. He was afraid because showing too much would definitely shoot her down. After showing her profound control, the royal family might be trying to tie her down. But with this transformation, there was a possibility of the royal family using their influence to suppress her and get whatever they wanted. If they didn't receive it, they would consider Anna's act as treason and carry out the execution. Still, he hadn't seen Anna's true spirit body, so he didn't know how big the gap between this transformation and the true spirit body was. Even the marshal trembled upon seeing this transformation. In normal cases, he wasn't afraid of anything, considering he was a spirit transcendence. The only one who could fight with him equally was Commander Oscar or Alexander, but from the power of this transformation, he'd got a sense of dread, not because of her power, but because of her potential. If Anna could completely grow to her fullest potential, there was a chance that her power would be so strong that no one could bind her anymore. Even the king had to re-evaluate the situation. Still, the fight had yet to end. The lightning was shattering the rocks that covered Eden. Anna had just shown a strength second only to the true spirit body. If their power was equal before, this transformation would have completely overcome the gap. Ha! Anna roared while releasing all her strength to complete one full swing. Exclamation mark Eden could feel that the rock was beginning to be crushed. And eventually, ah! Eden screamed out of reflex. Anna managed to complete a full swing. As a result, the rock was completely crushed to the point where his hand was sticking out of the rock. There was a deep cut wound on his hand. Eden was clutching his hand, not being able to move his finger. He doubted he could use this hand for at least a few months even after it was healed, the cut was simply too deep, but, this wasn't enough to make him give up, if he lost this time, his family would be ruined. I haven't lost. Eden made a clutching motion with his other hand, the ground suddenly surged out as if they were alive, trying to form a sphere that would completely lock Anna inside, Anna simply stomped the ground, using that force to scatter her lightning. The lightning had far surpassed the rock and shattered them into pieces. But there was a reason why Aiden was one of the twelve arbiters. The sphere earlier was just a distraction. When Anna destroyed it, the floor trembled as it shot up to the sky, forming a giant humanoid golem. Its height was more than eight meters and its fist alone was as big as the arena. More importantly, the golem joined both hands together and planned to slam the arena, crushing Anna altogether. Even the audience was terrified. This was one of the reasons why Aiden's rank was pretty high. In fact, each arbiter had the power to destroy an entire town with ease. Obviously, Aiden was having a hard time controlling that massive amount of spiritual energy. Without it, he wouldn't be able to attach all these rocks and turn it into a giant golem. Blood started flowing out of his mouth, nose, and eyes. Yet, he still maintained his focus as everything would end with just this attack. Seeing such a challenge, Anna took a deep breath. Because everyone was so focused on the glum, they didn't notice the excited smile on Anna's face. The instinct of the Bazooka had begun influencing her mind, taking this glum as a challenge that needed to be overcome. She sheathed her blade once again. All her spiritual energy was concentrated in one place only, her sword. There was nothing to protect her other than the reduce impact zone, just by releasing their spiritual energy alone. A fighter could exert some pressure. The more they concentrated their energy into one particular spot, the more pressure it brought. Anna did it before, but because she always shot out the excess energy, it didn't accumulate enough to achieve such a thing. But this time, she sealed all that energy within the scabbard of her sword. Instinctively, both the sword arbiter and the marshal had placed their hands on their blade, 
the spiritual pressure emitted from Anna's blade was so strong that it deepened the crater. This would be a deciding clash between Anna and Eden. Everyone became tense, preparing for the worst. Ah, Anna suddenly felt something nostalgic. This amount of pressure, spiritual energy, and challenge couldn't help but remind her of what had happened in her previous life. Her soul instinctively recognized this challenge. It's been a while since the last time I wielded this much power. Anna surprisingly closed her eyes for a moment. There was a scene that flashed in her mind. Noel was standing in front of her. This is the day I defeat you. You won't be able to escape anymore. Anna glared at Noel while concentrating her energy on her sword. If you can. That is. Noel raised his hand. A huge flame erupted from the ground like that of a pillar, releasing tremendous heat. It burned everything. Whether it was the soil, the grass, or even her spiritual energy, her lightning fluctuated as if the flame was forcing it to submission. K.H. Anna gritted her teeth. She wasn't afraid of this flame, but it didn't change the fact that Noel had clearly shown that if she wanted to defeat him, she would have to do more than that. Anna fell silent for a moment. Her lightning was overwhelming. She had known that fact, but it still lacked the explosiveness that Noel's fire possessed. To bridge that gap, she had to create an artificial burst, whether it was her instinct or her talent, and who actually sheathed her blade. If she lacked that burst of energy, she had just sealed it and unleashed everything in one go. Exclamation mark. Even Noel raised his eyebrows, noticing what she was doing. There was an eerie silence for a few seconds before Anna and Noel leapt at the same time. Both of them waved their sword diagonally as their abilities erupted. The sky turned white and black for a second. The black flame was overwhelming the lightning, trying to burn it into nothing. The lightning was rampaging around, stubbornly resisting the fire. In that split second, both of them had passed each other. What remained after that clash was shattered, dried ground with everything was reduced to ashes. Interesting. Noel smiled as he involuntarily dropped his sword to the ground. It appeared that his hand had grown so numb that he couldn't even hold his sword. On the other hand, Anna's hands were shaking uncontrollably. If not for the fact that she switched to both hands to resist Noel's violent attack, her condition would probably be the same as his. That's an impressive attack, but that's not enough to defeat me. As Noel said those words, the temperature had dropped indicating that his ice element could still fight. But Noel simply left that time, remembering that scene. Anna couldn't help but smile. Noel had been pushing her to the limit the whole time. This technique was developed in order to defeat Noel, but in this life, they were fighting together. Back then, you were like a mountain standing in my way. Whenever I climb it, I feel like it's never ending. But what if we climb it together? Will I still continue climbing that mountain? No, I think the answer is simpler than that. We will simply destroy the mountain. Destroy all the mountains standing on our path. Anna gradually opened her eyes. Her expression was tranquil as if the gloom didn't have any effect on her. The lightning suddenly disappeared from everyone's vision as if she had just given up. But this was the calm before the storm. She accumulated all that into this one single slash. A slash not to climb the mountain but to destroy it. Raging Lightning Descent. As she called its name, Anna drew her sword and the entire arena was overwhelmed with blinding white light. Chapter 852. Conclusion. The blinding light overwhelmed everyone in the arena. The audience covered their eyes with their hands while doing their best to see what was happening. What is happening? I can't see anything. There was a lot of confusion because they had to prepare for the worst. Fortunately, the four arbiters in charge of the protection were the most reliable. The fire arbiter might be ranked low among the arbiters, but the sword arbiter, fleeting arbiter, and void arbiter were ranked first, fourth, and fifth, respectively. When the blinding light dimmed down, the audience tried to look at the fighters, wanting to know the result of the battle. However, what they found could be considered a disappointment, instead of the conclusion of the match. They saw three people coming into the arena. The first person was the sword arbiter, who cut down the pressure from the energy Anna released. The second one was the void arbiter, Anna's teacher. She formed a blue vortex that swallowed the giant stone hands as another vortex appeared nearby, connecting the hands. Last but not least, the fleeting arbiter. He had the most crucial role as he was the fastest among the three. Kevin appeared in front of Anna and placed his hand on the back of the sword's handle, preventing Anna from releasing that strike fully. 
but Anna managed to unleash a bit of her blade, causing the spiritual energy that had been stored inside to leak. That leak alone caused the blinding light as well as the sword Darbita to interfere directly. What? What is happening? The sword, Void, and Fleeting Arbiters are stopping the match, but who wins in this case? Come on, why do you have to intervene? The audience was disappointed because they couldn't see the conclusion, ignorant of how close they were to losing their lives. When the people started raging, the marshal suddenly opened his mouth, announcing with his spiritual energy. I shall explain everything in detail. The stone arbiter's gillum was strong. If he smashed down, the entire arena would be destroyed. In fact, this entire area might be leveled and everyone would be in danger as the attack would render the barrier useless. When they heard the first explanation, they thought the winner was clear. The fact that Count Erden could bypass the barriers made by four arbiters and multiple grandmasters meant he far surpassed Anna's strength. However, the marshal continued, but dot we have to take a look at the ability that Anna Stargaze was about to release. That dense energy would be unleashed at full force. Just like how the compressed air would explode when it could expand in an instant, her ability is the same. The lightning would wreak havoc in the arena, while it won't be able to destroy the barrier completely. There is a high possibility that a hole will appear, the lightning will pass that hole and endanger the audience. More importantly, we can't forget the fact that she is using a sword. That sharp energy will cut down the rocks, and the lightning would shatter the remaining rock. With the stone arbiter's current condition, there was a high chance of him losing his life. Hence, as a marshal, I have to declare that Anastarges is the winner of this match. The arbiters are free to refute my explanation. The fleeting arbiter and the void arbiter immediately bowed their heads, saying the same thing, no, sir, your explanation is correct, the sword arbiter nodded, I agree with the marshal, if this fight happened in the wild, an astargaze, without a doubt, would kill Count Erden, this, the people were in complete silence, on the one hand, marshal's explanation was clear about the result, on the other hand, no one could tell if that was true or not, however, the last thing that needed to convince them just occurred, Count Erden shouted, I haven't lost, that puny lightning won't be able to kill me, I can still fight, there was a desperate action from Count Erden, his expression showed that he had agreed to the explanation to some extent, but for one reason or another, he refused to accept his loss, Count Erden tried to move his glum's body, but the sword Darbiter drew his sword, it was just an instant, but all of a sudden, the giant hands were cut as the Void Arbiter changed the blue vortex and sent the giant rocks outside the city. That's enough, Stone Arbiter. You have to accept your loss. The Sword Arbiter glared at him. If you think that's not enough, you may challenge the position again next year. After the Sword Arbiter's ultimatum, the king finally stood up and declared, Anastarges has won the challenge and she'll become an Arbiter. Anna sheathed her blade and turned around, walking toward the king with a solemn face. Then, she kneeled on one knee while lowering her head. I declare from now on that Anna Stargaze shall be known as Lightning Arbiter. Her official rank shall be determined at a later date. According to the tradition, the Stone Arbiter shall retain his title as an Arbiter, but he shall be deprived of his duty. If he wishes to regain his official position, he will be able to challenge another Arbiter next year. Anna Stargaze has become an Arbiter at 19 years old. She is the youngest Arbiter in Mewville Kingdom's history. Ooh, the people were stunned and confused. Although they felt some disappointment that they couldn't see the result of that last clash, the king had declared openly that they had a new Arbiter. And this new Arbiter was none other than the most talented person in their kingdom. Even the Sword Arbiter, the strongest Arbiter, only became one when he was 26 years old. She managed to break that record by a whole seven years. And no one would be able to break this record anytime soon. Amazing. She is able to reach this far at that age. How strong will she become in another ten years? I think she has the biggest shot to become a spirit transcendence. That's right. The Supreme Banner Army has a spirit transcendence. Commander Oscar. And our Mashal is also a spirit transcendence. With her, there is a chance that we will have the third spirit transcendence. When that happens, our kingdom will be considered the strongest among the four kingdoms. You uh, uh, Anastargaze, Anastargaze, Lightning Arbiter, long live the king, long live the kingdom. 
the cheers erupted from one spot and the others followed suits, celebrating the appearance of a new arbiter, still, there was one thing that only nobles could see, the common people were oblivious to it, but the fact that Anna managed to become an arbiter meant that the Stargaze family currently had two arbiters. There were a few families who had two arbiters in the past and those families were so strong that no one dared to challenge them. With that father and daughter bear, the golden age of the Stargaze family would come soon. Even though Kevin Stargaze was only a Marquis, his status might rival that of Dukes and Duchesses. Hence, the nobles were thinking about what they could do in this situation. On the one hand, there was a possibility of marrying Anna since there was no news about her engagement. On the other hand, the royal family had been showing their interest in that matter since one year ago. They also had to consider not to anger Kevin, fully knowing that they would be besieged by two arbiters. Amidst the cheers, the king had left the stadium as a security measure. His expression was grim after announcing good news for the kingdom. In the past, he had been suppressing Kevin Stargaze. Now that Anna stood by his side, if he continued doing that, Anna might take her anger at the royal family. With those two arbiters, everything could happen, especially if the third prince decided to join the fray. He had to use Josephine to control Anna Stargaze's actions. If he couldn't do it, he'd find a way to kill Anna before she became too big. That was why he had to leave and arrange the plan as quickly as possible. Meanwhile, Anna finally stood up after receiving her title. Her father came to her with a smile on his face. Congratulations, Anna. Thank you, father. Anna bowed with a calm face as if she wasn't that happy receiving it from her father. When Josephine did the same, Anna put on a smile to show that her affection was for her teacher rather than for her father. On the other hand, the sword arbiter came to Kevin while saying, Congratulations, Kevin to think your daughter will be able to reach this stage at that age. I'm really envious, if only my grandsons can even get half of her achievement, I would be satisfied. Thank you, sir, your grandsons are also talented too, you just don't have to be so harsh to them, sir, is that so? Though, I prefer a bit harsh, or else, they would be defying me. The sword arbiter chuckled, indirectly implying the relationship between Kevin and Anna, in any case, the kingdom will be noisy for a while, and you will have a lot of things to do. Indeed, Kevin nodded. I hope that you can help me take care of my daughter in the royal court. Ha <laughs> ha. Is that a signal? I don't restrict her. I see. Either way, you should watch out for the next few days. I'm not very sure, but I can feel a strong presence inside the capital not long ago. Kevin didn't answer him, knowing fully what the sword arbiter was saying. There was a possibility that this strong existence was trying to eliminate someone, and since they were on the rise, there was a chance that they would be the target to maintain the kingdom's balance. Kevin bowed to him politely to express his gratitude. Meanwhile, Anna had left the arena first, following Josephine. Unbeknownst to all of them, appointing Anna as an arbiter would plunge the kingdom into chaos, not because of her talent, but because of what she planned to do with that position. Title, Walker of the Worlds, 1822-1828, by Grand Underscore Void Underscore Daoist. Chapter 1822, Crown Princess Request. Being alone, Lin Mu took a look at the bookshop finding it to be old. Its exterior was rather weathered, and it reminded him of Jing Wai's Emporium. Old memories reappeared in Lin Mu's mind, making him reminisce about them for a bit as he walked in. There didn't seem to be a shopkeep present inside the shop though. The inside was a lot better than the outside even if the furniture looked to be older. After all, the furniture was made from immortal wood, that would be priceless in a mortal world like the Xiofan world. Here it was the basic wood to make things with and people didn't care much about it, still, the books on the shelves were even more valuable with most being either written by various immortals as their experiences or having information about various items. Lin Mu lightly scanned the store with his immortal sense and discovered that most books were informative there. There were no cultivation techniques or chi skills kept here, at least not the obvious ones. Lin Mu picked up on a few books that were travelogues on the outside, but actually contained incomplete chi skills and more inside of them. Though figuring them out wasn't easy and one needed to read the entire book and then comprehend them, they were more like a clue than actual skills. Lin Mu casually read a few when he heard a voice, like anything. Lin Mu looked at the counter where the shopkeeper would sit and saw a familiar person there. Crown Prince, 
Lin Mu greeted the man with cupped hands. The man had appeared out of nowhere and Lin Mu hadn't sensed him either, and this was despite the fact that he had his immortal sense extended in the area, there were no spatial fluctuations either, thus Lin Mu knew the man hadn't teleported there at least. You were rather early. Crown Prince spoke while tapping on the counter. Guess that's a good trait to have, he said before walking out from the side. How could I be anything but early, since it was you calling? Lin Mu replied, putting down the book. You can keep it if you want, the Crown Prince said, looking towards the book. This don't I need to pay? Lin Mu asked. It's fine. We own this shop anyways. The Crown Prince waved his hand. Ah royal property. Lin Mu now understood why the man had called him here. Most of it is out property. We just rent it out. The crown prince replied. So you can take what you want here. I won't be polite then. Lin Mu wasn't one to give up on an offer like this and quickly gathered the books that he found interesting. There were multiple books talking about various resources, plants, and best of all, different worlds. Thus, Lin Mu knew they would all come in handy for him eventually he liked to learn anyway, thus it was a treat for him, having stored the books away, Lin Mu looked at the crown prince before finally asking, so why is it that you called me here, well, it isn't me that wanted to meet you in particular, the crown prince replied, oh, then who, Lin Mu was surprised, I did, Lin Mu heard another presence appearing behind him, crown princess Shang, he was once again surprised as to how she also managed to appear like this, they are definitely using a tool. Lin Mu thought to himself, similar to Du Gu Shan. It also made Lin Mu think about the man's spatial storage tool. Lin Mu desired to take it with him, but knew it wasn't possible. After all, if he took it in front of so many people it would be concerning. Plus it was a custom to return the remains of those that had died in the tournament back to the people that were related to them. But in the case of Du Gu Shan, it was even more dangerous as he was under investigation due to practicing the Six Faiths Soul Mystic Eye. It was obvious that clues to that would be in his spatial storage tools, thus the temple had custody of all that. There was no way Lin Mu would be able to get his hands on them easily. You are up against Yao Cheng Ying tomorrow, Crown Princess Shang said in a tone tinged with glee. I am indeed. We did as you told and used the brackets. Though we could only do it twice, Lin Mu replied, that is more than I had thought, Crown Princess Shang said before chuckling, besides you'll be going against her too, so that will count as three, she added, these bracelets, how much will they weaken her though, Lin Mu finally asked, it had been bothering him for a while, and he hadn't been able to see any obvious change on Yao Cheng Ying at least, if you've used it three times she'll be weakened by at least 50%, Crown Princess Shang answered, though adding your companion slap, the insult being to injury should disturb her mentally to perhaps, she said, while laughing a little, it was clear that she was amazed and pleased by Lu Xu's act too, 50% should be quite good then, Lin Mu replied, considering the fact that the temple thinks I can match up with her in strength, indeed, you've shocked quite a lot of people, crown prince feng joined in, even in the royal court, they've mentioned you, oh, I hope it was in a positive aspect, lin mu inquired while raising his brow, of course, they were pleased that you removed a problematic character like du gu shan, the crown prince feng said before waving his finger in the air, among those that du gu shan defeated, there were quite a few nobles too, a few names appeared in the air that Lin Mu recognized, these nobles at least have a positive image of you, Crown Prince stated, I see, that's good to hear, Lin Mu replied before turning to the princess, was there anything particular you wished to talk, yes, in your fight against Yao Cheng Ying, can you just kill her, chapter 1823, a modification and surprise, hearing that the crown princess wanted Lin Mu to kill Yao Cheng Ying right away, he was rather taken aback, after all, it was quite literally against the rules of the tournament, then there was the fact that the crown prince Feng and crown princess Shang were both from the immortal court, for them to offend the temple of the four guardian beasts that had direct links to the immortal court simply didn't make sense, but he didn't reply to her right away, wondering if she had more to say, 10 seconds passed like this in silence before he heard her laugh, ha ha ha, I'm joking, crown princess Shang laughed, can't I even tease you a bit, ha princess, Lin Mu let out a breath of relief upon hearing that, 
he had almost wondered if the crown princess was a bit insane. I know it is against the rules to kill her, besides, she'll be dying, eventually. The crown princess clarified, you weakening her and fighting her should be good enough for later, she added, I see. Though I reckon you won't be able to do it here. In the Rust Sky world, Lin Yu wondered if they would take the risk of doing so. You are correct. Fighting and killing Yao Cheng Ying anywhere on the Rust Sky world would be a massive diplomatic issue. Crown Prince Feng spoke up. In fact, it's as simple as giving an order for me to have her killed here, but the consequences of it would be a war, he said casually. Lin Mu could tell that while the Crown Prince seemed to be relaxed and casual from his behavior, it was merely a front, a mask he used to gain an advantage over people, it was something Lin Mu could understand very well. Well then, so you just asked me to meet you of this, Lin Mu questioned, as it didn't seem necessary. After all, all of this could have been said over the communication jade slip too, of course not. The crown princess shook her head, give me the bracelet I gave you, she asked, Lin Mu raised his brows at that, but still gave it to her. Crown princess held the simple looking bracelet in her hand and took out another small bead. The bead was white colored and seemed like a pearl, though looking at its texture. Lin Mu could tell it was a polished stone of some kind. Tilda Shua. The crown princess held the bead against the bracelet before using a skill of hers. A small vine grew out of her sleeves before wrapping against the bracelet and the bead. It drilled through the bead and attached it permanently to the bracelet. Here you go. The crown princess handed the item back. What did you do to it? Lin Mu questioned. Strengthened it a bit and added a little extra surprise for Yao Cheng Ying. The crown princess answered. Strengthened it? By how much? Lin Mu raised his brow. And what's the surprise? Combined with the previous bracelets, it should reduce Yao Cheng Ying's strength by about 60%. Crown princess Shang answered. As for the surprise, let's just say I got a little inspiration from your companion Lugzu, but it's no fun if you know it too. Just see it for yourself she said with a sly smile, I'll look forward to it then, Lin Mu said with a helpless smile, well, we won't take any more of your time, you can go prepared for the match, Crown Prince Feng stated, I'll see you after the finals next, very well, goodbye, Lin Mu bid both of them farewell before leaving, once Lin Mu was gone though, the Crown Prince and Princess talked amongst themselves, was that necessary, Crown Prince Feng asked with a smirk, teasing him, what? It's hard to resist. The crown princess chuckled. I haven't met anyone other than you that could keep his composure like that. All others just melt seeing my appearance. That does seem true. The crown prince nodded his head. Perhaps it really is, as monk Hushu said. Mulin is meant for the Buddhist path, he added. Hey, don't let him turn into one of the celibate baldies. The crown princess frowned childishly. That's up to Mulin. I can't do much about what he chooses. Ha ha, the crown prince said before disappearing into thin air. Bah, the crown princess shook her head as well and disappeared too. Lin Mu who was on his way back to the restaurant had no idea about their conversation. Instead, he was focused on the modified bracelet that now had a white bead added to it. He used his immortal sense to check it, but couldn't figure out much. There was a barrier present on it that prevented him from looking into any details. I can break the barrier but it'll also damage the bracelet, Lin Mu thought. I guess this is a safety feature in case it is found by someone else. They won't know it's real use that way. He reckoned. Soon enough, Lin Mu was back at the restaurant and told his companions about the modified bracelet. They were surprised that he had been invited by the crown prince to meet. But they were also pleased that the bracelet was strengthened further. It just meant that their previous failure could be negated to a certain extent. Four more hours passed as the night rolled in and then another seven hours later. It was daybreak. It was the day of the semi-finals and the people were very excited about the first match that was between Child Wildfire and Third Prince Feng Baxing. Lin Mu and his companions also watched it eagerly, wondering just how it would go. With Child Wildfire's breakthrough, he is technically above the third prince in terms of cultivation base, but will that really help him? Lin Mu wondered as he waited for the match to finally start, millions of eyes watched as the two contestants were finally teleported into the spatial plane, chapter 1824, Feng Baxing vs Child Wildfire, Child Wildfire and Feng Baxing appeared at a distance of 100 meters just like others, 
but they didn't waste any time in waiting and attacked directly. Tilda Shua. Feng Baxing used his hand to create a vortex that surrounded him like a protective barrier while child wildlife slapped out with his palms, sending out fiery palm imprints that threatened to burn Feng Baxing. But before the palm imprints even reached him, the spinning winds around Feng Baxing stopped them. Tilda whoosh. The winds churned and erased the palm imprints into nothing. Are you just gonna stay hidden in your barrier like before? Child Wildfire scoffed. You did the same last time as well. If you can't even touch me, your words are worthless, Feng Baxing replied without caring for his opponent. Instead, he just raised his hands and slashed out, creating blades of wind that flew towards Child Wildfire with deadly precision. Child Wildfire clapped his hands together, creating a wall of fire that managed to block the wind. But that wasn't all as he spun around to kick, sending a thick arc of fire that lashed out on the wind barrier. Tilda boom, the fire arc and barrier collided, creating a large explosion. Feng Boxing narrowed his eyes, as he could feel the top layer of the barrier actually eroding away from Child Wildfire's attack. So you've improved. Feng Boxing could see the power that wasn't what he had experienced before. More than you. Wanna see? Child Wildfire said before a wave of chi spread out from him. Tilda whoosh. The wave of chi directly rocked the barrier of wind and pushed Feng Boxing back. At the same time, a searing heat could be felt coming from Child Wildfire's body as he started to glow in a red light. The people in the audience instantly realized what had just happened. Six, sixth, sixth tribulation stage of the immortal realm. Someone shouted, Child Wildfire has reached the sixth tribulation stage. How is this possible? Wasn't he just at the fifth stage earlier? People wondered. When did he break through? Child Wildfire has successfully hidden his cultivation base from everyone, with only Lin Mu knowing it. This ended up catching Feng Boxing off guard. He frowned a little before taking out a fan from his spatial storage. Looks like I'll have to take you seriously, he said before opening the fan. The fan looked like it was made out of large feathers, but it was unknown what beast it belonged to. Still, a few keen eyes in the audience seemed to recognize it. Shearing Hurricane Fan. It's actually the Shearing Hurricane Fan. Isn't that supposed to be kept in the treasury? Heavens. Did the Emperor gave the Third Prince the fan? It was clear that the fan was rather well known. What's that? A young man sitting in the audience asked the person beside him. Is it something famous, uncle? Of course. It is one of the treasured weapons of the Imperial family. It is a peak grade mortal weapon and is made from the feathers of the great hurricane falcon. It is said that the former emperor of the Dao Wind Empire hunted down a seventh tribulation stage great hurricane falcon that was causing troubles in the empire. After killing it, the corpse of the great hurricane falcon was refined into materials that were later turned into immortal weapons. The uncle explained. Wait. You mean to say there are more of them? The young man was surprised. Of course. The corpse was enough to make three immortal weapons, the hurricane covering parasol that is the personal weapon of Emperor Feng, the shearing hurricane fan that the third prince is using and the hundred feathered hurricane daggers. The uncle answered, are all of them peak immortal grade weapons? The young man wondered, after all, peak grade immortal grade weapons were quite limited in number and not everyone could see them. Not only did they need valuable resources to make, but also needed to be nurtured for a long time to reach their full potential. No, out of the three, only the hurricane covering parasol and the shearing hurricane fan are peak grade immortal weapons. The hundred fettered hurricane daggers are high grade immortal weapons though. The uncle explained, Tilda Boom, their attention was quickly pulled back to the fight as another large explosion took place, but unlike the previous ones, this one wasn't due to fire, instead, it was Feng Boxing who had done it, the shearing hurricane fan in his hand glowed in an azure light and emanated strong immortal chi waves, if there were people with weak cultivation bases present here, they would pass out simply from the pressure and not even the attacks, but that wasn't all. As wind dao traces could also be felt at the same time, the shearing hurricane fan gleaming with them, Feng Boxing swung the fan, creating a gale that directly blasted away all that was in front of him. Child Wildfire was forced back for 500 meters, while the land was devastated, leaving a long gully that was 20 meters deep and 100 meters wide. Tilda gasped, 
the audience that saw it could tell that attack was something they would never be able to go up against. So you're gonna rely on that weapon huh? Looks like I finally forced your hand. Child Wildfire smirked, not minding at all that his opponent still seemed to be holding up against him. Instead, Child Wildfire brought his palms in front of his chest. You're not the only one who has a weapon. Child Wildlife said as a small orb rose from his chest. The orb was red in color and orange flames were burning around it. It was small, but strong fire doubt traces could be felt from it. Is that a Dao embryo? The people wondered. It really is. Anyone know what Dao embryo it is? Child Wildfire's Dao embryo seemed to be rather rare. A few elders in the audience tried to guess, but it wasn't something they could recognize. Only one person ended up recognizing it and that was none other than Lin Mu. Scorch Sun Ruby Dao embryo. So he actually has that. Lin Mu muttered in surprise. His companions heard it and wondered what that was. You recognize the Dao embryo, Brother Mu Lin? Ming Lian asked, I do. It is one of the rare Dao embryos of the Fire Dao. Lin Mu replied, What's special about it? Lu Xu asked, not knowing much. If I recall correctly, it allows one to use the scorching sun flames. They are several times stronger than normal flames and can melt stone and steel with these. Lin Mu explained, What makes them stand out from other flames? Though, Luo Likin asked, there are many fire Dao embryos after all. All of them can melt things. He wondered. The intensity of the scorching sun flames is so strong that even its user isn't free from its effects. If one is careless, they could very well end up burning themselves to death. Lin Mu explained, shocking his companions. Tilda gasp. It is such a dangerous flame that if one managed to make the scorching sun ruby Dao embryo, they cannot even use it right away in Dao Treading Realm. Even if they reach the Immortal Realm, it will take them a long time to be able to use it safely. I've even heard that Seventh Tribulation Stage Immortals have perished to their own flames, when they were unable to handle it. Lin Mu added, surprising them even more. That is, Ming Dandan was at a loss for words. Will Child Wildfire be able to handle this? Then, even his sixth tribulation stage immortal realm cultivation base doesn't seem enough. Kian Wen wondered. He should be able to. One of the ways of overcoming the flames is to raise one's own resistance to fire. It can be either through body cultivation or using resources that can directly boost it. Lin Mu answered. Child Wildfire doesn't have body cultivation, so I think it's the latter for him. He added. Hearing that. They all couldn't help but wonder just how it would go for Child Wildlife. It is time for you to be burned. Child Wildfire said as he raised his hand, creating a large sphere of fire in the sky. The sphere was nearly 10 meters wide and burned in a fierce red light. Scorch Sun Domain. Child Wildfire shouted, to mortals, it would seem like a new red sun had appeared in the sky. The heat from it was enough to soften the ground of the spatial plane. A few seconds was all it took for the brown soil and grey rocks to turn red hot. And a minute later, they had softened into a dough-like consistency. Of course, this was only the start as the temperature kept on rising. Now burn. Child Wildfire pointed at Feng Barxing, causing a fiery rain to fall from the sun. Chapter 1825, Scorch Sun Domain. Child Wildlife's Dao skill was simply stunning to all those that watched it. Lin Mu who had his immortal sense inside the spatial plane could feel it even better. Even I'll have to take this attack seriously. Might even be forced to use the spatial skills. Lin Mu thought to himself. Tilda boom 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 boom. The fire continued to rain down from the sun and covered the land. Feng Baxing had to focus on defending for the time being and continued to swing his shearing hurricane fan. Tilda. The shearing hurricane fan created jets of wind that spread out from Feng Baxing's body, pushing all the fireballs away. The barrier on the other hand was unable to withstand the fireballs as the heat was simply pushing the wind away. Feng Baxing was surprisingly forced to retreat while using the peak grade immortal weapon. Lin Mu who was observing him though found something strange. He can't use the fan properly? Lin Mu could sense the immortal chi fluctuations from the fan and found them to be a bit erratic. The people in the audience couldn't tell this due to being separated, but Lin Mu could still pick up on it, though the doubt traces that covered the fan also made it hard to tell. Only those that were versed in the wind Dao would be able to tell what was actually happening to the shearing hurricane fan. It's almost as if, 
the shearing hurricane fan's abilities are restricted. Lin Mu realized though he couldn't tell why, he thought of the words of the audience and quickly thought of something. Wait. They said the shearing hurricane fan was kept in the treasury of the imperial family. If Feng Baxing took it only recently, it is possible that the spirit of the shearing hurricane fan hasn't fully accepted him yet. Lin Mu analyzed. If it really was as Lin Mu had though, it would be the same as unrevealing another weakness for Feng Baxing. It also made sense as to why he hadn't used the fan before this. All the opponents that he had met were far too weak to warrant its use. It even made Lin Mu wonder if there were additional limitations to it. Even for the Imperial family, peak grade mortal weapons aren't something that can be easily obtained. If the Emperor has given it to Feng Baxing, there might have been other conditions that he put forth. Lin Mu pondered before his mind went to the words of the Crown Prince Feng Shun. Considering that he's the Crown Prince, the Emperor definitely favors him, thus it wouldn't make sense as to why he wasn't given the fan. Is the Shearing Hurricane fan the true reason why the Crown Prince is forgetting the Third Prince? Lin Mu was starting to look deeper into the conflict. Things were starting to make sense now. Perhaps the Emperor put a limit of usage on it. The Third Prince might only be able to utilize it a few times before it is unusable by him. Lin Mu muttered to himself. Huh? Did you say something, Brother Mu Lin? Liuo Likin asked. Nothing. Just talking to myself. Lin Mu shook his head. I see. Liuo Likin turned his attention back to the fight while Lin Mu continued to think further. The match had been running for about 10 minutes now and Feng Baxing seemed to be on the defensive. Child wildlife had turned the entire battlefield into a sea of fire by now. Not just that, but the ground directly underneath him had already melted and turned into a lava lake. And this lava lake only continued to expand in size as the red sun burned in the sky. This forced Feng Baxing to stay in the air, as landing on the ground would put further stress on his defenses. But even this didn't last long. As the sun continued to grow bit by bit, the larger it grew the more the temperature of the spatial plane rose. The air had become superheated, and the average temperature of the area exceeded 100 Celsius. This was massive considering the full size of the spatial plane which was over tens of kilometers in area, and this was just the average temperature. If one got close to where child wildlife and the sun was, they would find the temperatures touching upon a thousand Celsius. It was a temperature that would threaten the lives of the immortals too and wasn't something most immortals would be able to survive in for long. Even with their defensive skills and tools, there was no guarantee that they could last that long in this. And one must not forget that there wasn't just damage due to the high temperatures. There was also the presence of fire down traces as well as violent fire elemental chi mixed in all this. An immortal would not only need defense against pure heat, but also from the fire elemental chi. This was something most immortals would be able to put up with up to a certain extent. But when the fire Dao traces were added to it due to the Dao skills, most immortals would be unable to do the same. Perhaps only those that were resistant to this could manage to defend themselves for long. One would need a water Dao skill, or have an affinity with the fire Dao to be able to last long in this. Lin Mu reckoned, but even those with an affinity with fire would have to keep on retreating. After all, these are scorching sun flames. He thought before switching his attention to child's wildfire. There Lin Mu saw that the man was actually suffering too. There were burn marks on his fingers while parts of his robes were starting to get burned too. Lin Mu saw faint runes appearing on the robes, trying to resist the scorching sun flames. Those robes might not long last. Lin Mu realized that this was how Child Wildfire was managing to use the Dao skill. The robes that he was using were different than his previous robes and Lin Mu reckoned they were defensive immortal robes. Normally they should have been able to last for a long time against fire, years even, and be able to repair themselves naturally, but now, these robes were getting damaged past the point of no return. Lin Mu witnessed the runes breaking down one by one, as the formations started to get weaker and weaker. The fibers of the robe were burning and a few minutes later, the sleeves were already gone. Feng Baxing who had an irritated look on his face all this time noticed the change in child wildfire. So you're using this despite the injuries. Let's see how long you can keep up. The prince smirked before raising the shearing hurricane fan up high. Tilda Hong, a strong wave of immortal chi burst out from the fan, and transformed into a corporeal form. 
At first, it looked to have no shape, but as Feng Baxing continued to pour more and more immortal qi into it, it started to change. What is he doing? The audience was confused. Is that a skill? It's definitely a qi skill of some kind, they reckoned. But as they continued to watch, their eyes went wide at the scene. The shapeless immortal Chi had taken on the form of a large beast that looked like a bird of some kind. Tilda P.I. The bird raised its head and let out a loud cry that shook the battlefield. Heavens, what beast is that? They were astounded. That, that, that's the great hurricane falcon. Someone finally spoke. Lin Yu who watched it narrowed his eyes as he didn't know what exactly was happening. Oh, to further Lin Mu's surprise Zukong seemed to have awakened as well to think he could manifest the spirit. That is the manifestation of the immortal weapon's spirit. Lin Mu asked in surprise. Indeed, Xu Kong confirmed. Lin Mu knew that when immortal weapons reached the peak grade, their spirits could take on a material form, though this was something that took a long time and a lot of resources to do so. This wasn't the first time Lin Mu was seeing such a spirit manifestation either though. Back in the deep sapphire city, Lin Mu had met Lan Bao. She was also a spirit that had taken on the form of a mermaid, though compared to the spirit that Feng Baxing had manifested, she was leagues above. Now, let's see if you can stand against this, Feng Baxing shouted before commanding the spirit. Tilda P.I. The weapon spirit let out a loud cry before charging towards child wildlife. Being the weapon spirit the great hurricane falcon had all the powers of the shearing hurricane fan. In fact, the spirit could use the powers of the fan several times better than what Feng Baxing could do so. And it was demonstrated soon enough, when the spirit charged through the sea of flames, splitting it apart. Chapter 1826, Severe Damage The shearing hurricane fan's spirit's power was astonishing for all those that watched it. It easily tore through the scorching sun flames, while keeping its own form intact. Others weren't able to see it clearly. But Lin Mu who had his immortal sense inside the spatial plane saw a lot more. The great hurricane falcon is surrounded in an invisible armor. And it's fully composed of wind dao traces. Lin Mu realized. In fact, he could even sense something extra alongside the wind dao traces which made him think that the great hurricane falcon might actually be using wind dao insights too. Dao insights were of a higher level than the dao traces and Lin Mu hadn't seen that many. In fact. The only reason he could even tell that these were Wind Dao insights was simply because they were of a similar feeling to the Saintess's abilities. Lin Mu was well aware that the Saintess was an expert in them and could use them to a great level. Just the extent of what she could do with them was astounding, having created clouds of various kinds as well as moving things soundlessly. What the Great Hurricane Falcon was doing was rather simple as compared to that. It was simply wrapping them around its body and preventing the fire Dao traces from affecting it. It also managed to keep the scorching sun flames away and successfully managed to get near Child Wildfire. Ah, Child Wildfire shouted in a mix of pain and anger as he pushed his hands towards the incoming weapon spirit. Both of his hands had turned into flamethrowers and continually spewed out scorching sun flames. Tilda P.I. With the added offense from Child Wildlife, the Great Hurricane Falcon was actually slowed down and needed to actively resist it. It let out a cry and opened its beak, before spewing out a sharp jet of air. Tilda Shewa, a strange sound was heard as the jet of air rapidly cut through the incoming scorching sun flames and actually blasted them back. ARGH, Child Wildfire got hit with his own attack and hurriedly cut off the skill. Still, it wasn't enough as these were scorching sun flames. They could sustain themselves on their own for a while and quickly covered his robes. Child Wildfire's robes that were already breaking, started burning rapidly. The runes on them broke down within seconds, as the robe turned into mere rags. Thankfully this also ended up using up the remaining energy of the scorching sun flames and prevented them from further burning child wildlife. Unfortunately, this was merely the start of injuries for child wildfire. Tilda, in the next moment he was struck by the great hurricane falcon, the bird's body hit the man like a truck, sending him flying all the way to the end of the spatial plane. Tilda thud, child wildfire crashed into the ground, his body leaving a shallow gully as he continued to move back. The force of the attack was simply too much, and the man's rib cage had already caved in. Copious amounts of blood spewed out of child wildfire's mouth, and nose while his heartbeats turned weak. 
Lin Mu could sense the man's vitality falling rapidly and his control over the Dao embryo awakened, he'll die at this rate, Lin Mu said while gasping, child wildfire was in a strange state where he was still considered conscious since his Dao embryo was intact, this made the teleportation rays of the spatial plane think that he was fine and it didn't trigger, but Lin Mu knew due to the unique condition of Scorch Sun Ruby Dao embryo which had a rather hard to control nature child wildfire might continue to get injured, in fact, Lin Mu could tell that his vitality was also being damaged since the Dao embryo stayed active, the red sun in the sky continued to rain down fire, harming child wildfire as well, this situation created a loophole in the activation conditions of the teleportation arrays, preventing child wildlife from being ejected, at the same time, Lin Mu was sure the man didn't have the strength to surrender either, Tilda Hu, there's no other choice, Lin Mu made a decision at that point, his immortal sense went towards child wildfire and he started to chant, a couple of seconds later, child wildfire's mind went still and the flow of his immortal chi was interrupted, tilde shua, this caused the link to the Dao embryo to stop and the red sun in the sky disappeared in an instant, tilde whoosh, the scorch sun ruby Dao embryo flew back into child wildfire's body in the teleportation rays of the spatial plane finally triggered, Tilda Shua, child wildlife was considered as having lost his consciousness and was teleported out of the spatial plane, Humphrey, just as I thought, far on the other side, Feng Boxing harumphed and withdrew the fan, the great hurricane falcon dissipated as well and returned inside the shearing hurricane fan, Tilda Shua, he too was teleported out, where the audience was already shouting in excitement and awe, third prince, third prince, Feng Boxing has defeated Child Wildfire and is the winner, the elder overseeing the match finally declared, and once that was done, he quickly focused on the condition of the battered and burned man, Child Wildfire's breath was weak and his pulse was also slow, healers, check him right away, the elder ordered while also checking the man himself, and when he did, the elder was astounded, what, he couldn't believe the condition that Child Wildlife was in, his hand meridians have burned away along with his flesh and his legs are also severely burned, one of the healers reported, his dantian has sustained damage as well and his immortal chi stores are at the bare minimum, hurry, his nascent soul is getting unstable, the healers saw something severe, elder, we need to secure his nascent soul or it might leave the body beforehand, the elder had also seen the damage and acted quickly, chapter 1827 saving child, after all, they knew that if the nascent soul left the body before it was truly dead, child wildlife might lose his cultivation base in the best case, and his life in the worst case, something like this was rather rare and only happened when the body was damaged beyond a limit when using Dao embryos and Dao skills, such was the strain that was put on one's body due to them, that was the reason why cultivators were not supposed to use the skills lightly, and using them should also be done within limits if they didn't the consequence of it were lethal, Lin Mu had seen this several times before back in the Xiao Fan world when the elders of the northern tribes used their shared Dao skills, thankfully, child wildfire was in the best possible place to get injured like this, the temple of the four guardian beasts was no joke and had the best possible people to deal with this, the head healer also arrived and started stabilizing child wildfire's nascent soul while the others tried to restore some immortal chi, they had to be very careful in doing this since child wildfire's meridians were also damaged, they had to gently inject small amounts of immoral chi so that the damaged meridians wouldn't be stressed too much and break apart, they even ignored the fleshly injuries of child wildlife as they could later be taken care of, it was also useless to deal with them at this moment since they were all caused due to the scorching sun flames, these kinds of burns were not easy to heal and common pills would not work on them, it would take long term treatment to heal them, if it was even possible at that point, Tilda sigh, Lin Mu who saw this couldn't help but sigh, it was his own doing, the best I could do was to eject him from the spatial plane, Lin Mu thought to himself, child wildfire was no naive man and had used his Dao skills knowing very well that it could bring harm to himself, as such there was no one he could blame other than himself, and considering his personality that Lin Mu had observed so far, the man wouldn't have it any other way either, at least he fought well, he certainly did force Feng Boxing's hand, 
Lin Mu muttered to himself, Child Wildlife was the only person who had forced the third prince to use the shearing hurricane fan, and not just use it but also summon the weapon spirit. Summoning the weapon spirit should have also come at a cost. It takes a lot of immortal chi after all. Lin Mu thought to himself. Feeling curious, he used his immortal sense to check the crown prince as well. Sure enough. The immortal chi fluctuations coming from him have fallen as well. Lin Mu muttered, he has probably used up more than 80% of his immortal chief or to have fallen to this level. He reckoned, this was good information for Lin Mu as he now knew that the third prince also had his limitations. After all, Lin Mu would be facing the man soon too, and needed to know as much as he could about him. If he didn't know about the shearing hurricane fan and that it could summon the great hurricane falcon weapon spirit it could be very enduring for him and could very well spell his defeat. Without his spatial skills, there were limitations to what Lin Mu could do to stop it after all. Just the shearing hurricane fan would be more than enough to threaten Lin Mu. And if the weapon spirit was also summoned, Lin Mu would be pushed to his limits. It made him think about what he could do to counteract this. I'll need to think of a way to survive it all. Considering how much immortal Chi Feng Boxing lost in that short time, it is quite clear that using the shearing hurricane fan and summoning the weapon spirit consumes a lot of immortal chi. As long as I can endure that, Feng Boxing will have lost. Lin Mu thought to himself and formulated a potential plan against the man, Novelnixt.com. The previous scenarios that he had made needed to be changed quite a bit due to the addition of the weapon fan. Originally Lin Mu had thought that he would simply focus on breaking the wind barrier and then getting close enough to attack the third prince, but now there was the additional threat of the shearing hurricane fan, reckoned. One thing is for sure, I'll have to use all my cultivation for this. Only by using my body cultivation will I be able to endure all that. Lin Mu reckoned. And while he was thinking all this, Lin Mu's companions were coming to terms with the conclusion of the fight as well. How did Feng Baxin get that fan? Do you know anything, Qian Wen? Liuo Likin questioned. As far as I recall, the shearing hurricane fan is something that the emperor wouldn't give out easily. Qian Wen replied. In fact, I recall even the crown prince being denied in the past. He added. Even the crown prince? But isn't he the strongest? Mingilian questioned. Indeed which makes the entire matter even more confusing. One thing is for sure though, the third prince probably had to force the emperor to give him the fan somehow. How he did that though is a mystery. Kian Wen answered. Since Kian Wen who was the most informed about the matter of the imperial family couldn't figure it out, the others also didn't think further. Back at the tournament grounds, the healers had already transported child wildlife away and the arrays were now being reset. Ahem exclamation mark tilde the overseeing elder coughed, silencing the crowd. We'll be shortly resuming the tournament in two hours, the contestants Yao Cheng Ying and Daoist Mu Lin should be prepared, he announced. Lin Mu opened his eyes upon hearing this and focused on his current opponent for now. Chapter 1828 Lin Mu vs Yao Cheng Ying The time for Lin Mu's fight with Yao Cheng Ying approached, but the audience was still continually talking about the previous battle, to them. The fight between Child Wildfire and Feng Boxing was possibly the most exciting fight in the tournament so far. So much so that they didn't take much interest in Lin Mu's fight. It was somewhat understandable too, as they simply thought that the winner was already decided. Only a few in the audience even thought that Lin Mu might even give Yao Cheng Ying a proper fight. To the majority, the match was predictable and Yao Cheng Ying would be the inevitable winner. In fact, there were people betting on how long it would take for Yao Cheng Ying to defeat Lin Mu instead of who would be winning. Liuo Likin saw this and spent no time in taking advantage of the bets. He quickly placed a significant amount of fortune on Lin Mu's win while waiting for the fight to start. Tilda hum, the token in Lin Mu's waist hummed again as a reminder, waking him up. Time for me to head out, Lin Mu said as he stood up. His expression was calm, and it didn't seem like he was bothered about the fight at all. This inspired confidence in the minds of his companions, who all spoke up. Good luck brother Mu Lin, you are bound to win this fight. We'll be waiting for you eagerly. MMHMM, I'll see you guys in a bit, Lin Mu said before taking his leave. But as he was walking down the stairs, he saw a familiar woman. Daoist Mu Lin has come rather far. I can't help but feel pleased. 
The elegantly dressed woman spoke. Countess, I hope that you'll continue to like my performance. Lin Mia replied as a courtesy. Of course, I hope that you win all the weight to the end. The Countess laughed. And if you win in the end, I'll even throw you a large banquet. Ha <laughs> ha. I look forward to it. But for now, I have to take my leave. Lin Mu replied. Go on, show that woman tricks can only bring one so far. The Countess smiled before leaving. Lin Mu went down and got a few more looks from the staff of the restaurant. But they were a bit more reserved this time. No one talked to him or tried to stop him the rest of the way, and Lin Mu quickly reached the tournament grounds. Oh, she's already waiting. Lin Mu hadn't expected for Yao Cheng Ying to have been there beforehand. The woman had her eyes closed and stood with a still expression. Her hand was still resting on the handle of her sword though, and Lin Mu could sense a faint aura of sharpness around her, looks like she's ready for a battle too. Lin Mu could tell that from just a look. He got onto the platform and waited for the RAs to get ready. The audience was talking about them as they watched him appear. Some talked about the winning chances while others wondered just how much power would Yao Cheng Ying would be showing them today. Lin Mu spread his immortal sense and was ready to observe any changes that might be happening to Yao Cheng Ying's demeanor. He was checking whether she had any defensive tools active, or if there was anything else going on with her. Will I be able to get her with the surprise attack again? Lin Mu wondered as he lightly glanced at the bracelet on his wrist. The bracelet had been strengthened by Crown Princess Shang and should be a lot more effective than before, which should make things easier for Lin Mu. Though at the same time, Lin Mu somewhat felt like he wanted to fight the woman at her full potential. It was his curiosity to see just how strong she was and also whether he could stand up against her when his spatial skills were restrained. Tilda Sai, I shouldn't think beyond what's necessary for now. It'll only distract me in the fight. I cannot take my opponent lightly. Lin Mu reminded himself. He recalled his experience with Du Gu Shan and knew that underestimating an opponent could be very dangerous. His previous fight was a wake up call and made Lin Mu be a lot more cautious about it all. The gate is now ready. Both contestants shall enter it. The elder overseeing the tournament finally announced. Tilda Hu Wu, Lin Mu took a deep breath and walked towards the teleportation gate. His spatial perception was also activated, as he wished to strike the woman as soon as he stepped into the spatial plane. At the same time, he wanted to know what action she would be taking. Tilda Shua, Lin Mu and Yao Cheng Ying both stepped into the gate and were soon teleported away, their bodies turning into a blur, in the teleportation channel. Lin Mu spread his immortal sense and used his spatial perception to quickly narrow down the spot where he and Yao Cheng Ying would be arriving at. I need to take the initiative, Lin Mu thought and manipulated his arrival location to be just behind Yao Cheng Ying. Normally the contestants should appear facing each other, but Lin Mu's improved understanding of the space as well as the array allowed him to manipulate it just enough to change the normal orientation. Tilda Shua, Tilda Thud, where's Daoist Mu Lin, to them, only Yao Cheng Ying seemed to a few moments later. The two finally appeared inside the spatial plane, and the formation screen focused on them. But the people in the audience noticed the strangeness. Where's Daoist Mu Lin? To them, only Yao Cheng Ying seemed to have arrived. The spot where Lin Mu was supposed to arrive was empty and the fermentation screen was focusing there. Look, one of the people pointed to another formation screen that was pointing at the back of Yao Cheng Ying. He's behind her. Someone shouted. How did he get there? They couldn't believe it. Lin Mu had appeared right behind Yao Cheng Ying just as he had planned, and was just a meter away from her, his hand was already extended and was about to touch the woman's back. You dare? But much to Lin Mu's surprise, Yao Cheng Ying moved. Tilda Clang, she extended her left hand and blocked Lin Mu's hand, preventing it from touching her back. He was stopped just an inch away from her. He had intentionally come from the left so that Yao Cheng Ying wouldn't be able to draw her sword in time. And yet, she had blocked it with her free hand. Lin Mu widened his eyes as he felt the energy covering Yao Cheng Ying's hand. The energy was preventing him from making direct contact with her, and thus the bracelet hadn't activated. You thought I wouldn't know your tricks, Yao Cheng Ying said with a hint of anger in her voice. I've seen your fights. You like to ambush others, but it won't work on me she said before pushing back with her hand. Tilda whoosh. A palm imprint flew out of Yao Cheng Ying's left palm, forcing Lin Mu back at least five meters before he stopped. You've caught me. 
Lin Mu lightly replied, but I have more than that, he said before directly stomping on the ground till the crack the ground shattered under the force, as Lin Mu shot towards Yao Cheng Ying at a great speed. Not so easily, Yao Cheng Ying frowned and drew out her sword. Tilda Xing novel next dot com. The long sword hummed with energy as sword intent poured into it. She drew it in one stroke and slashed it out in the same movement. Tilda slash. The sword slash reached Lin Mu almost immediately, threatening to cut him down. But that wasn't what happened, as Lin Mu met it with his own sword. Tilda clang. Afternoon Pine struck the sword slash, blocking it. That's not enough. Yao Chen Ying smirked, as the sword intent imbued slash split apart. While it was blocked in the middle, the slash continued onwards and struck Lin Mu's body. The people watching it widened their eyes in shock. He's done for. Tilda Deng. But unlike what they had thought, a shocking thing happened. The two parts of the sword slash did hit Lin Mu, and even damaged his robes but they didn't manage to actually injure him. Tilda R.I.P. Lin Mu's robes were cut, revealing his body underneath. A faint line was left where the sword slash had hit him. What is that? Why is he glowing? The audience noticed his peculiar skin. He. He's not injured at all, they saw. How's that possible? Not even a cut, is that an armor? They wondered. Yao Cheng Ying also noticed that her attack hadn't worked and furrowed her brows. Lin Mu, on the other hand, looked at his robes that weren't regenerating. In fact, he could feel the formation of the robes simply dying out in an instant. Tilda sigh. I'll have to buy more self-repairing robes. Guess sword intent can damage them permanently, Lin Mu muttered to himself. Much to Yao Cheng Ying's surprise. You. You're bothered about your clothes in all this? Evolution start as a raft. 295 to 300. By I am Link. 295. A lone venture into the gate of hell. Rain looked towards the azure sky, and the towering giant tree in the distance. After a long silence, Rain didn't answer the sea god's question. He looked far away, and said faintly, once someone told me, what's broader than the sea is the sky, and what's vaster than the sky is a man's mind. If there are huge waves ahead, then set sail and stand on the pinnacle of the waves. If there is an abyss ahead, then spread your wings and fly high, galloping in the abyss. Nobody can stop my steps except me. The sea god squinted slightly, put down his coffee, and looked at rain. His words suddenly made him look at this young man in a new light. From the no man's land, breaking the hundred year taboo, and entering the sky class C area, without his iron will and firm determination, he couldn't have made it. The person who told you those words, my father, Rain said with a helpless smile. I used to think he was irresponsible, but now I understand that he carried a greater responsibility. After a moment of silence, the sea god suddenly said, the world tree will open two paths this time, one leading to heaven and the other to hell. But, between heaven and hell, there's just a thin wall. I'll do my utmost to help you find the right path, the sea god said seriously. I'm sure that the other fleets will follow you. Who will eventually get the sea god fruit is yet to be determined. Rain nodded. Thank you, sea god. I've told my crew that if we can snatch the sea god fruit, we will. If we can't, we won't fret over it. The sea god asked curiously, aren't you going to be commanding on the spot? Rain smiled slightly, when the time comes, I'll let Trojan and Avril take command. They are also excellent captains. I'll have to trouble you then, young brother Rain, you don't have to worry about that. No matter which fleet I'm with, I will do my best to assist them. Besides, I quite like your fleet. Time passed quickly, and as the final moment approached, the atmosphere between the surrounding fleets grew tenser. No one was walking around the island anymore, everyone was waiting for instructions on their warships. Rain noticed that some of the fleet's warships seemed very advanced. For instance, the Thunder Fleet had about ten main ships equipped with huge long barrel cannons. Similar weapons could be found on several other large fleets. However, the Sea God assured Rain not to worry. Because once they entered the world tree, all fleets were not allowed to fire. If the world tree collapsed, it could possibly lead to an unknown disaster. At that time, it might affect the entire sea area. To compete for the sea god fruit, the key would still be decision making, and the competition among the crew. Two days later, waves started to ripple on the sea surface, gently swaying at first, 
then gradually increasing in amplitude. The world tree is about to open. The sea god stood at the side of the ship, looking at the changing waves. We're setting off. In a moment, thousands of warships appeared on the sea, a multitude of boats competing, all heading towards the towering world tree. Dot. As they drew closer to the world tree, everyone was astonished at the magnitude of this tree. Its massive roots, like hundreds of serpentine dragons, coiled around the immensely sturdy world tree. All ships had to slow down and carefully navigate between these gigantic roots. After passing through a large number of intertwined roots, the sea god suddenly said, the entrance is inside one of these roots. Everyone, get ready, we're almost there. True to his word. They soon came across an exceptionally large root, half of it exposed above the water, the other half submerged beneath. This root was different from the others. Its end was open, like a giant cave, about 150 meters wide, with an exposed height of 70 to 80 meters. My god, just one root is this huge. See god, are you sure we have to go in through the roots? Avril asked. I'm sure. The surface of the world tree is covered with sharp spikes with toxic slime on them. We can't get near. The only way up is from the inside. Make sure your warship has enough horsepower. We have to go upstream. Avril took a deep breath. They were about to enter the world tree. She turned to look at another ship, where Rain was at that moment. To be precise, Rain was the only one on that ship. Trajan saw Avril's concern and patted her on the shoulder. Avril, we have to do our job. Avril nodded heavily, I understand. The dad was the first to enter the tree hole, closely followed by other fleets. All the fleets knew that the sea god was in their fleet, and following them was the wisest course. Large numbers of fleets entered the world tree one after the other. The waterway inside the tree hole was dark and narrow. Avril and her team turned on their lights, and constantly used their radio equipment to maintain contact with the other captains to avoid any ships getting left behind. The sea god was sitting cross-legged in the control room, his eyes half-closed, as if he was trying to establish a connection with the world tree. After about ten minutes, a fork in the road appeared. Be careful. The left is the road to heaven, leading to the upper layer of the world tree. The right is the gate to hell, leading deeper into hell. Don't take the wrong turn. Avril's heart tightened. She controlled the ship to take the left fork and then quickly rushed to the cabin window, her eyes fixed on the other ships. Sure enough, Rain took the right fork. The sea god seemed to have noticed something and rushed over. Upon seeing the ship, he asked angrily, what's happening? Didn't I say to take the left path? What are they doing? He didn't know that before they entered the World Tree Sea area, Rain had already formulated a strategy. The crew would take the road to heaven, while he alone would explore the gate to hell. See God, that's our captain's ship. He, Fancy's eyes welled up with tears. What? Didn't Rain hear what I just said? You must make him turn back. It's too dangerous down there. Even I can't sense what's there. Trajan patted the sea god on the shoulder. Sea god, the captain knows where that leads. The sea god's eyebrows knitted together in shock. He, he knows. Now the sea god finally understood what Rain meant when he said that Avril and Trajan would be commanding at that time. He deliberately chose the gate to hell? He wants to explore the source of the world tree? Rain, you madman. 15. 296. Inside the world tree. Captain, the fleets ahead have split into two routes. The team behind promptly reported to their captain, one of the ships went right. Is the sea god on that ship left? They must be trying to mislead us. Follow the sea god. They think this little trick can fool me. Without the sea god, they wouldn't even know the way. The fleets behind were all closely watching the sea god's movements, so they unanimously chose to follow the left fleet. And the fleets even further behind did not see rain taking the other path. Before long, the sea god said to Avril, There is a counter current ahead. We are preparing to accelerate upstream. Roger that. All captains be prepared to accelerate. Fancy had been leaning against the window, watching until that warship disappeared into the darkness. Rain, you have to come back alive, or I'll never forgive you. Fancy said with tears in her eyes. Rain sat in his seat, preparing to transfer his consciousness to the ship, but at this moment, White somehow appeared. White. How? How did you get on this ship? Rain didn't expect White to stay on board. Woof woof. 
White barked at Rain a few times, wagging his tail happily. White always liked to follow Rain wherever he went. There was no time to send White away now. Rain squatted down and petted White's head, you rascal, you have no sense of organization or discipline. Well, you're much stronger than before, maybe you can help me, I'll take you with me, just watch over my body for me. Woof woof. Rain's sea god's child body was secured by the seat belt, and his consciousness was currently merging with the ship. He could clearly see that no ships had followed him. For a moment, his warship was the only one in this waterway. Amid the surrounding darkness, it felt somewhat lonely. Rain believed that Avril and the others could follow his orders and prioritize safety. The sea god fruit was not a must-have. Such a big tree. I refuse to believe you grew naturally, Rain muttered. The wood heaven crystal must be here. Speaking of which, although Rain had acquired the fire heaven crystal, earth heaven crystal, and metal heaven crystal, none of them were obtained easily. One could say they all involved life and death situations. So when the sea god mentioned the dangers of this journey, Rain chose the gate to hell without hesitation. Display full topographic scan. The system quickly completed the scan. Even though it was pitch black here, Rain was able to clearly observe the surrounding environment. The surroundings were a sealed tunnel, and it felt like he was some microorganism traveling in a blood vessel. There were no forks in the road, just one way forward. He sailed along the waterway, and after about ten minutes, the water gradually began to become turbulent, as if the direction of the current was leading him forward. Ding! A large waterfall is located ahead. Please prepare in advance. The system sounded an alarm. Rain checked the map ahead. The topography ahead was a bit frightening. The routes were almost vertically downward at a 90 degree angle, and the passageway seemed to become narrower than before, almost filled by the water flow. Even the flight mode couldn't be switched. Damn, so I have to be swept down with the water flow. It seems I can't take the warship on the road ahead. Rain quickly returned to the sea god's child body, unbuckling his seatbelt as he spoke. White, the ship is too large. We too will go down and let it wait for us here. The ship opened the hatch, and Rain and White jumped into the sea together. The sea was turbulent. Rain carried White on his back and rushed along the water flow. In a moment, they arrived at the waterfall ahead. White, hold your breath. As soon as Rain finished speaking, the two were directly swept down the waterfall. The waterfall was about 300 meters high, but just as the two fell into the bottom layer of the waterfall, there was a second waterfall less than 50 meters ahead. The passage below was filled with water with no gaps, and it was fortunate that White's body was far from ordinary, able to hold its breath for a long time. On the way, Rain went through a total of eight waterfalls, each one two to three hundred meters high. From the radar map, he calculated that he had dived at least two thousand meters. After experiencing the last waterfall, the space here suddenly expanded a lot. The water surface was only half of the passage, and White finally had the opportunity to take a breath. Damn, White, luckily we can breathe here, otherwise I would have to supply you with oxygen. Rain carried White and swam forward. Woof woof. White seems to have found something and barked loudly. Rain turned on the flashlight and pointed it ahead. There was actually land ahead, and on the land, there was a huge stone gate. Damn, aren't we supposed to be inside the hollow root of the world tree? Why is there? There's land here. Rain was also confused and could only carry White towards the land. Arriving at the stone gate, Rain shone a light on it. There were two lines of characters on the stone gate. Heaven has a road you won't take. Hell has a door you insist on entering. When you open this door, you will bring endless disaster to this world. Rain was shocked and stood still. Damn, what? What does this mean? Bringing endless disaster to the world was definitely not the outcome Rain wanted. The warning was a bit scary. Rain frowned, not knowing whether to go in or not. On the third day of entering the world tree, Rain was looking for any clues that would help him make a decision on the stone door when the previously orderly situation on Avril's side was finally broken. No weak fleets could mix in the Sky Class C area, and even though this journey was extremely energy consuming, the fleets were well prepared and most of the ships completed this journey against the current. As they continued to sail upwards, the road gradually began to widen. The fleets behind also started to speed up and catch up, almost sailing side by side with the dad. On the third day, 
the sea area in front of them was quite wide, and thousands of warships were almost lined up. Sea God, what exactly is this place? What is the structure inside the world tree? Why is there such a wide space? Olivia asked puzzledly. Sea God smiled slightly, do you think the world tree is just the huge tree you see? Um, isn't it? Avril asked curiously. Sea God smiled slightly, if it weren't for my mental connection with the world tree, I might think the same as you. But later I realized that's the reason why it is called the world tree is because its roots are rooted in the entire earth. What you see is just a tiny part of it that is exposed above the sea. Trajan frowned, that's not right. Even if it's like that, we have indeed been going upwards. According to our route, we should be at least four to five hundred meters above sea level. So by this calculation, we should be inside that small part of the world tree that is exposed. No matter how developed its root system is, the above water part is only that wide. Sea God smiled slightly, and turned his head to look at Trajan. Do you know about high dimensional worlds? Huh? Entities living in a low dimensional world can never see the full picture of a high dimensional world. Seeing the puzzled expressions on everyone's faces, Sea God thought for a moment and said, let me give a not very appropriate, but relatively easy to understand analogy. Inside the world tree, there are multiple worlds, and we have entered one of them. As for Brother Rain, the one he will enter will be another world. 11297. The Elf of the World Tree. It's hard to imagine that such a vast space was inside the world tree. Or rather, there were so many different dimensional worlds inside the world tree. At this point, Avril and the others realized the importance of the sea god. Without this guide, it would be almost impossible to find the sea god fruit. Sea god curiously asked Avril, Avril, I heard that your warships have the ability to stealth. Why didn't you use it before? If the others didn't follow, with my help, you could have obtained the sea god fruit on your own. Avril smiled slightly, Mr. Sea God. Didn't you say that this sea god fruit is very dangerous? I think perhaps we need the help of others to get this fruit. Sea god nodded. Your thinking is very reasonable, but are you so sure that you can snatch the sea god fruit from so many strong ones? This time, not only Avril, but also Trajan, Shob, Charge King, and others showed a resolute look on their faces. This is what the captain needs. We will definitely get it. Fancy expressed everyone's thoughts at the moment with determination. Three days later, Rain and White were still sitting on a rock. Occasionally Rain turned his head to look at that door. After searching for a long time, he didn't find any other clues that could guide him. Only the two lines of words on the door. The first line was okay, just a warning about the danger behind the door. But the second line really made Rain hesitate. When you open this door, you will bring endless disaster to this world. Damn, it can't be that the earth will be destroyed as soon as I open the door. Rain frowned. If he acted rashly and really caused some irreversible disaster, that would not be what he wanted to see. Just as Rain was hesitating, suddenly, the door opened by itself. Damn, what the hell? I didn't open it. Rain looked at the door in horror. The tall stone door did not open completely, just a small crack. Rain was so scared that he backed away. He wasn't ready, but the door opened by itself. Through the crack in the door, only darkness could be seen inside. Damn, is this door open or not? Rain stared at the crack in the door. Just as he was on high alert, he noticed that something seemed to be moving behind the dark door. Before long, a figure walked out of the darkness. Rain quickly activated Scaly Dragon's second and third transformations and was ready to activate the Soul Contract at any time. It wasn't a monster that came out, it was a green dressed young girl. She was not tall, just over 1.6 meters, but she was extremely delicate, with big, clear, and pure eyes, a gentle appearance, and quite the feeling of a lily girl. Although her skin was fair and smooth, delicate enough to blow off. Her expression showed a bit of concealed fatigue. There's someone. Rain was stunned. You. Are you the so-called disaster? As he spoke, Rain maintained a high level of vigilance. Although this girl seemed harmless to both humans and animals, who knew what she was? Those who could reside within that door were probably no longer genuine humans. The girl in green tilted her head and looked at Rain. Disaster? 
No, I am the spirit of the world tree. I have been guarding this world. Rain's brows furrowed deeper. For 400 years, I've been waiting for a human who meets the criteria. Rain didn't know what to say, so he just let the girl keep talking. Everyone is after the sea god fruit produced by the world tree. This also has to do with me intentionally directing my messenger to guide you. But you are the only one who isn't focused on the sea god fruit. Of course, by chance, some have come to this door before. They either choose to enter or leave, and some are indecisive like you. But what distinguishes you from them is that what truly perplexes you is not the danger from beyond the door, but your responsibility towards this world. Unable to hold back any longer, Rain finally asked. How do you know what I'm thinking? The girl gave a small smile. You've been mumbling at the door for three days. Do you think I'm deaf? Rain was speechless. He thought it was only him and White here, so naturally, he voiced his thoughts out loud. It turned out that everything was heard by this girl. Such a thick door, yet the soundproofing was so poor. Since he had been caught out by this girl, Rain had nothing to worry about anymore. All right, you're right. Although I'm not a good person, I wouldn't go as far as destroying the world. Besides, if the Earth really encounters a cataclysm, I wouldn't have a good end either. This is just the awareness that a smart person should have. The girl gave an ambiguous smile. You're quite interesting, insisting that you're not a good person. Anyway, do as you please. I heard you say that you came to find the Wood Heaven Crystal, and I also sensed that your warship is already equipped with three Heaven Crystals. The girl spoke thoughtfully. Perhaps someone could really gather all five Heaven Crystals, open the ancient gate, and resist the impending catastrophe. But the girl then shook her head, as if denying her own words. It's impossible. Even I don't know where the Water Heaven Crystal is, so even if you gather all four Heaven Crystals, it won't help. After thinking it through, the girl looked at Rain again and said affirmatively, I don't mind telling you that the Wood Heaven Crystal is behind the door, but first, with your current strength, you probably can't get it. Second, you can't take it. Rain frowned at the girl. You know my strength. And why can't I take it? The girl looked at Rain and let out a cold laugh. You think your body as the child of the sea god is invincible? I'm sorry, the wood heaven crystal is currently binding the real sea god. Or rather, the existence of the entire world tree is to bind the sea god. Inside there are 108 fully formed bodies of the childs of the sea god forming a powerful servant, all of which I'm suppressing. If you take away the wood heaven crystal and I lose my source of energy, the consequences would be unimaginable. If the sea god regains freedom, he will lead his army and sweep the globe. Then all the islands will be submerged, all the races will sink and float under the sea god's lewd power, enslaved by it. And you humans, unsuitable for living in the sea, will be wiped out. The amount of information was a bit overwhelming, and Rain was slowly digesting it. Hey, young girl, what do you mean by the impending catastrophe? The green-clothed girl said, the invasion of the eight extraterrestrial races. No one can withstand their invincible fleet. No one can defeat their invincible army. They will plunder all of Earth's resources, and the Earth will cease to exist. This is the calamity of mankind, and also the calamity of the whole Earth. We are doomed. What I'm doing now is just struggling to survive before the disaster. Rain was stunned. 12. 298. The only sea god. Rain. Although you are qualified to enter the gate of hell, you are too late. We can't change anything. We are out of hope. Don't struggle pointlessly anymore. After finishing her words, the girl turned around to go back through the large door. As the door closed again, a long sigh was heard from the girl in the darkness. If you had appeared 400 years ago, perhaps we would have had a chance, but now, ah, all our efforts are just struggles before death. Saying this, the girl walked toward the depths of the darkness. However, at this moment, a beam of light suddenly lit up in front of her. The door was actually pushed open. The girl turned around in astonishment, looking at the man and dog standing at the doorway. You, you, what are you doing here? The girl's eyes were full of confusion. At the entrance, the man said indifferently, Little girl, you're wrong. The man walked slowly into the door, and his Labrador followed him without hesitation. Whether the road ahead was filled with dangerous mountains, fiery seas, or deep abysses, as long as its master did not stop, it would not stop. 
I will never give up until the last moment. In this life, my fate can only be in my own hands. At this moment, the heart of the elf of the world tree trembled, could it be, she had been waiting for four hundred years, just for this man? The road ahead was pitch black, but next to the elf of the world tree, there was always a faint green light enveloping the two and the dog. Rain, once you take away the wood heaven crystal, not to mention the sea god's rage will engulf the entire world, just saying when you take the wood heaven crystal, the sea god himself will not spare you first, he will snatch your wood heaven crystal, the elf of the world tree said as they walked, so you must be fully prepared, your current form as the son of the sea god is not fully formed yet, I still have some sea god fruit here, this is our last chance, rain, following behind her, casually said, forget about the sea god, even 108 fully formed childs of the sea god would be enough for me to handle, so, elf sister, the sea god fruit you're giving me better be powerful, this, I can't confirm the properties of the sea god fruit, it all depends on your luck, the elf shook her head, or rather, it depends on the luck of all humanity, on the way, rain saw numerous large intertwined branches in the huge space in front of them, leading to an abyss, among those intertwined roots, he could vaguely see a giant figure, hundreds of meters tall, trapped within them, from the branches around, there were countless human figures bound by the branches into mummy-like knots of wood, elf sister, is that giant the sea god, and those in the knots of wood, are they the sons of the sea god, the elf girl stopped and turned to look at rain with a frown, hey, you, why do you keep calling me the elf sister, I'm much older than you, rain chuckled, the world tree was only a little over 400 years old, which was still younger than him, of course, Rain had no intention of explaining the details to the elf sister, I called you that because you look so cute, should I call you elf granny, the elf covered her mouth and giggled, why are you so glib, I thought you were a serious man, forget it, I won't argue with you, it's meaningless anyway, yes, the ones in there are indeed the sea god and his sons, restraining them has already consumed too much of my energy, without the wood heaven crystal, I wouldn't be able to do it, Rain nodded, it seemed that once he took the wood heaven crystal, these terrifying creatures would break free from the restraint of the world tree, so, he had to defeat them, after following the elf for an unknown amount of time, the two finally arrived at their destination, the elf finally stopped in a room formed by entwined roots, it's inside, every time I bear fruit, I only allow my messenger to announce a very small amount of fruit news, I hope to attract more capable people to the world tree through this method, to find the person I'm looking for, however, after all this time, you are the only one I've waited for, rain didn't say anything, just looked at the room, with a wave of the elf's hand, the roots clustered there came to life, slowly opening a hole, go in, what kind of sea god fruit you can find, it's up to you, the elf said, what if I eat a few more, rain suddenly asked, I remember people saying that the body of the child of the sea god can endlessly consume sea god fruits, eat more, rain, do you think this is ordinary fruit, although these sea god fruits are of no use to me and the body of the child of the sea god can indeed withstand a large number of sea god fruits, it's useless for you to eat more, the body of the child of the sea god is after all not the sea god himself, your limit is the stage 10 level 10, I've looked at your situation, you can eat at most four more, rain frowned, is there no possibility of a breakthrough, there is a possibility, but among all the childs of the sea god, only one can break through to stage 10 level 10, and that one is now being trapped by me, rain immediately understood, the exception that the elf was talking about was the sea god himself, as long as he was around, the other childs of the sea god would always just be childs of the sea god, rain, after you go in, I will lock you in, if you can't break my restraints on your own, it means you can't defeat the sea god and his many children, rain didn't argue, he nodded and walked into the root house, all right, I understand, after rain and white entered the root house, the elf girl stood at the door for a long time, saying in a trance, it's impossible, unless you eat all the strongest sea god fruits, you won't be able to fight the sea god and the 108 sons of the sea god, what are you so stubborn about, dot, rain was frightened by the sight in front of him, damn, white, we're rich, so many sea god fruits, in front of him and white, there were hundreds of sea god fruits piled up, what's more astonishing was that all these sea god fruits were brightly colored, 
from previous experience, these bright, slightly glowing colors indicated. These sea god fruits were all top tier. Damn, I've searched several oceans and only got a few pitiful ones. So, the world tree had all the good stuff. Rain had already consumed five sea god fruits before, and his current level was stage 6 level 10. Eating four more would bring him to stage 10 level 10. Hey, the world tree is not omniscient after all. The little girl didn't expect that my biggest capital is not the body of the child of the sea god at all. Rain laughed sinisterly. Activate the system. By the way, I remember that my system can erase previous mutations. Rain's eyes shone with excitement. 12, 299. The contest begins. This golden one can't be pineapple flavored again. Rain picked up a sea god fruit, and peeled it, revealing the golden flesh inside. Rain had a face full of displeasure. Hey, man, I've already eaten four golden ones. My teeth are about to fall off from sourness. Rain shook his head, I really doubt if these sea god fruits are ripe, each one is more sour than the last. He had no choice, it was a special period now, even if Rain could no longer eat. He had to force down this sea god fruit, an hour later, Rain checked the properties of this sea god fruit, mutation type, auxiliary mutation, throne of god, 140 level. Skill information, after activating the skill, you can quickly recover, forcibly refreshing all skill cooldowns. After forcibly refreshing skills, the body will suffer double the usual consumption. Certain skills with strong consumption side effects will return double the weakened state after refresh. At the current level, the throne of god can be used once a month. Rain frowned. This skill was not bad in theory, if he could refresh the dragon slaying slash once, it meant he could use two swords in a short period, but if he has to return to a doubly weakened state, he wasn't sure how long he would need to rest. Let's leave this skill for now, ah. Let me think, should I wash away the triple transformation of scaly dragon? The additional attack and defense of the triple transformation of scaly dragon were meaningless compared to the soul contract but the water attribute increase of the first transformation was still useful. Underwater, his attributes increased by 700%, which was a very considerable improvement. If he used the dragon slaying slash underwater, the power would be great. Or, wash away the gaze of Naga, Rain was again reluctant to part with it. The gaze of Naga could save his life or surprise the enemy at a critical moment. Damn. It's so hard to choose. Rain scratched his head hard. Ah, which one to wash away? This choice is too painful. I hate multiple choice questions the most. Especially when Rain saw that there were more than a hundred sea god fruits in front of him. The expression on his face became more pained. Damn, there's so much more to eat. I'm afraid I'll get sick of eating sea god fruits. Just as Rain was suffering because of a pile of top tier sea god fruits, Avril and the others were gradually approaching the legendary sea god fruit. We're almost there. The sea god's face gradually became serious. I can feel it. Slow down. Avril immediately ordered. Thousands of warships saw the speed of the dad slowing down and understood what this move meant. Deputy Leader Avril, an island is detected ahead. A crew member came to report. Avril and the others picked up their binoculars to look. Indeed, at a distance of about 50 kilometers from them, a solitary island appeared. The island looked not quite large, and according to the radar scan, it was about the size of 10 football fields. However, the island was completely flat, with only one towering tree. There's another tree inside the world tree. Trigen squinted. I didn't expect the world tree to be so magical. Upon closer inspection, one could see a huge fruit on the only tree on the island. The fruit was green and about the size of a person. That's the sea god fruit, isn't it? Olivia asked. The sea god nodded. Correct. My guidance has come to an end. It's up to you now. Avril and the others came near the glass cabin and looked at the surrounding warships. Many people on these warships also put down their binoculars. Obviously, they had also discovered the sea god fruit. Thousands of warships lined up in a row on the sea. Although no one took action, probably everyone knew that the current calm was just a prelude to the storm. After these warships slowed down and moved to a position 30,000 meters from the island, a strange scene occurred. All the warships seemed to be blocked by an invisible barrier. After a while, all the fleets stopped. The world tree prohibited the firing of warships. If they were to compete for the sea god fruit, 
they definitely could not rely on the power of warships. The Sea God had also said that the World Tree provided a special place for the major powers to compete for the Sea God fruit, and this barrier seemed to be the place he mentioned where they could take action. Avril. The barrier will open in five minutes, but warships and fighters are still not allowed in. You can enter by wooden boat, the Sea God said. You should act quickly, the other warships are already preparing. By the way, you must be careful. This competition for the Sea God fruit is very dangerous. I don't know what kind of dangers are hidden in this 30,000 meters of the sea, you must be careful. Avril nodded. The sea god had already prophesied that the success rate of this competition for the sea god fruit was less than 1%. The surrounding fleets were well prepared. They lowered wooden boats from the warships, and the elite crew members of each fleet boarded them. Some fleets brought their own sea monster pets. At this time, they all jumped on the bodies of the sea monsters, ready to enter the barrier. Avril and the others also opened the ship cabin one after another. Blackie. Avril called out to the sea, and a giant black head surfaced from the water, gradually revealing Blackie's massive body. All captains, vice captains, we let Blackie lead us. Time passed second by second, and in the fifth minute, after they touched the barrier, a halo flashed on the barrier. The flash of this halo meant that the barrier was open. At this instant, countless small boats, sea monsters, scaly dragons, and even divine dragons, like sprinters on a starting line, rushed forward as the barrier opened briefly. Avril and the others didn't rush but waited for everyone else to enter the barrier before letting Blackie set off. Even if they can reach the island, they won't be able to snatch the sea god fruit so easily. Since we have the guidance of the sea god, we should take advantage of it, Avril said. We follow behind them, ready for danger. For a moment, hundreds of boats were vying for the lead, and a large number of wooden boats, although small, moved at a speed akin to speed boats. The fleets were also not reluctant to equip the small wooden boats with advanced motors or have them propelled by powerful underwater mutant crew members. Those teams riding sea monsters were naturally not slow, and everyone rushed towards the island like bees to honey. In the blink of an eye, the fastest of these contenders had already moved 500 meters, but at this moment, the originally calm sea surface suddenly became turbulent. Suddenly, right where a large number of ships were concentrated, a huge, sharp tree root pierced out from the seabed, overturning dozens of wooden boats, and even impaling one of them, shooting towards the sky. The appearance of this wooden spike was just a prelude. Then, the entire sea surface began to boil. Countless wooden spikes, without warning, stabbed out from the sea floor. A large number of boats and sea monsters were caught off guard, and many were hit, with a few sea monsters over a hundred meters long being impaled and hung in the sky. This, Blackie, be careful. Blackie's eyes were resolute, his body agilely weaving through the protruding spikes, continuing to sprint towards the island. 11, 300. Becoming a dragon. Next. At first, these wooden boats didn't seem to have anything special, but when they encountered a crisis at this moment, these unassuming wooden boats on the sea suddenly entered a state of extreme maneuverability. On one wooden boat, a man was calm and composed. With a single palm strike on the sea surface, the whole boat flew up. The small wooden boat dodged left and right in midair, wedging itself between the large number of wooden spikes sticking out from the sea. Dealey snorted coldly lifting a chunk of seawater to form a wave, raising their small boat high above, dozens of meters higher than the heads of others, and dashing along the crest of the wave. Lena sat upright on the wooden boat, and the surroundings of the boat turned into a sea of fire, making it hard for the wooden spikes to approach. The sky-class sea area is full of strong individuals. These people finally showed a small part of their power, trying to shake off the entanglement of these winding wooden spikes. The dad also had its share of experts. Chob patted Blackie's head, Blackie. It's too dangerous in the sea, let me help you fly. With that, Chob instantly transformed into a cloud of fire. A large amount of hot air lifted Blackie up, and with this, Blackie was transformed into a black dragon soaring through the clouds. After the various strong individuals made their move, most of the boats and sea monsters used their powers to avoid the wooden spikes from the seabed and continued to sprint toward the isolated island. However, since the sea god prophesied the dangers of this competition, 
things would definitely not be resolved so simply. After advancing 5,000 meters, hundreds of tall tree people rose from the seabed. They were tall and mighty, about a hundred meters tall, with long arms that could extend. They formed a wall of people and continuously attacked the treasure hunters who were above the sea surface. In the sky, a large number of unknown petals fell, filling the entire sea area. These pink petals looked as beautiful as cherry blossoms, but when these floating petals fell on a huge flying fish sea monster, the body of the flying fish sea monster was directly cut open. Damn, it's the flower blade of the world tree, incredibly hard and sharp, everyone be careful, don't let these petals touch you, someone shouted, no way, I heard that this kind of flower blade only appeared during the first fruiting of the world tree, and it appeared again today, what the hell? There are vine-like wooden spikes in the sea, a tree person wall in front, and these deadly countless flower blades in the sky. How? How do we get past this? At this point, everyone truly understood that the difficulty of this competition far exceeded any previous one. At this time, no one dared to be careless anymore, and they all brought out their real skills. The middle-aged man who had lifted the wooden boat earlier stood at the bow of the boat, squinting his eyes against the wind with a grave expression on his face. The more dangers there are, the more it indicates the uniqueness of this sea god fruit. No one can stop me, the god of storm, from obtaining this sea god fruit. The man moved his hands in front of him, tracing a path, and suddenly his eyes burst with a brilliant light. Storm roar. Around him, a gale began to rage stirring up countless flower blades, while a tornado beneath the boat instantly lifted it nearly 200 meters high. Lena removed her outer coat, her beautiful eyes watching the god of storm's boat taking the lead in the sky, and she snorted coldly, Dewey, you want to be ahead of me? In your dreams, flames engulf the sky. There was already a sea of fire around her boat, but at this moment, the intensity of the fire surged blasting the boat directly into the sky. Even in the air, a spherical shield of flames formed around the entire boat, resisting the flower blades in the sky. The experts from all sides no longer hid their power, each displaying their skills, forcibly lifting the wooden boats over 200 meters high, over the wall of tree people wall, and continued to charge towards the isolated island. Of course, there were also many boats that had no way to defend against this kind of all-around attack and could only try their best to keep themselves from sinking. Avril, what do we do? I can't lift Blackie over 200 meters. Shob's voice rang out around them. Avril also had a furrowed brow. Blackie's body was too large. It was already difficult enough for Shob to lift Blackie. Lifting him 200 meters was almost impossible. Just as everyone was at a loss, Blackie spoke. That's our leader's sea god fruit, I will definitely get you guys there. Following that, Blackie roared softly, roar, transform. Blackie's body quickly expanded, the scales on his body rolling like waves, and dragon horns grew out from both sides of his forehead. His torso broke apart, revealing four limbs. Wait, Blackie can turn into a real dragon now? Fancy said in shock. Just as she finished speaking, Shobe suddenly shouted, not good. Blackie's body has become heavier, I can't hold him up anymore. Blackie, in his current state, seemed unable to fly. He had just transformed into a black dragon form but couldn't fly directly. He was falling downward with everyone aboard. Without a doubt, falling into the sea at this point wouldn't be a good thing. Just then, fire turkey in the sky rushed to shoot dozens of fire streams beneath Blackie. The fire exploded underneath Blackie, and the enormous shockwave, combined with Shobe managed to lift Blackie's body again, struggling to twist his body, after several efforts, Blackie finally caught the rising heat of the flames and shot straight upwards, good job, Blackie, Blackie really turned into a dragon, Blackie, fly, take us over, roar, Blackie roared, quickly rising, in the sky, a black dragon, aided by a cloud of fire, soared straight up, among the many fleets riding sea monsters, there was no shortage of those riding dragons, but their dragons couldn't reach a height of 200 meters. They all looked at the black dragon in the sky, faces filled with shock. Is this a joke? Why can that dragon fly? Our dragons can't fly that high. What kind of dragon is theirs? That one of theirs must have just evolved into a dragon from a scaly dragon. 
it's said that dragons that live in the sea long term can't fly, but if it evolved from a scaly dragon, then it is a real dragon that can soar in the sky. Only those who have gone through trials, grown in adversity, can break free from the bondage of gravity. Damn, those people are so lucky to have gotten this flying dragon. Of course, they didn't know that this wasn't a matter of rain's luck. Blackie was once seen by his parents as a young dragon with a poor physical constitution, so much so that even his scaly dragon mother couldn't bring him back to the King Class C area. Along the way, Blackie developed a deep bond with Rain, and together they had been through many battles. Blackie grew stronger through each battle. After consuming the heart of the Dragon King God, Blackie finally had the potential to become a dragon. Faced with this crisis, Blackie even more so stimulated his potential. Finally completing the transformation from Scaly Dragon to Real Dragon, realizing the legend of the Scaly Dragon tribe. Boss, I did it. Blackie's eyes were moist. Blackie will definitely become your right hand man. 13. 